So we're very, very happy to have Alexei to tell us about knot homology and the sheaves of pure scheme of point knot yeah, thank, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to come to Berkeley. It's a great weather, great view, great people. So thanks a lot. So, uh, please ask questions. Uh, title is not quite correct. I meant to talk about Kapustin Rozanski Saul in this year. So that will be there in a second. So, you know, this is like a uh, the basic thing which everybody knows. There is a Homfley polynomial, which everybody knows, you know, which is defined by this scaling relations and uh, normalization on, on knots and was discovered by um, no, it was discovered by these people and then uh, if you want to specialize to GLN invariant quantum invariant you just specialize a variable to this and then you know it was discovered by um, Havana for Rozanski in 2007 that you can upgrade uh, this invariant to like slightly rich invariant, you basically can construct a vector space with Havana Prozanski homology, such that if you kill one of the grading, you get back polynomial. So and it's zero invariant. So everybody knows that. Okay, that's just notation. That's my notation for the generators of the braid, and L beta I use notation for the closure of the braid. So that's how we encode our braids by taking well, our knots. We just take a braid and close it up. Yeah. Uh, what's the relation between this uh, Grimm's polynomial and this uh, how, how it's calculated? Yeah, so the relation is this one. So just a second. So if you set, uh, so let me put back. Great question. So if you set n equal two, you get like SL2 quantum invariant, which is the same as Jones polynomial. So basically, you would set uh, A equal Q in these relations, and you get Jones polynomial. And if you set A equal to one, you get uh, Alexander polynomial, which is like uh, GL0. Right. More questions? All right. So that's, that's just notations. So, and the, by the way, you know, the Hake algebra, right? So, you know, the Hake algebra is this object, uh, which is uh, um, defined by uh, what, what are the relations? You take a braid group, which is generated sigma one, and you impose one more quadratic relation. And for those who kind of know, you know, know that that relation is literally the same as uh, the scaling relation. That's actually, you know, if you scale, set A to one, you see the same relation. And it's actually not a coincidence. It's actually the reason. Okay, just not the same. Okay. okay, so the reason for the scaling relation is because, you know, it's this relation. And, you know, Jones in 1984, 87, uh, explained that actually on the, on this uh, Hake algebra, which is finite dimensional object, you know, it's a finite dimensional algebra of size and factorial, of dimension and factorial. There is a collection of traces. So basically for each uh, n, you have uh, its own trace, uh, but they kind of talk to each other. So meaning that, you know, they, they traces and uh, you normalize on for, uh, for each n. And there is one more condition. This is really important. This is a Markov trace condition. So because uh, you know, the picture here is that if you want your trace to define the not invariant, you want to Make sure that uh, something like this, that you have a knot like this, you close it up. You want to say that this is the same as a knot, right? And that's, and that's the condition. So here we went from the braid on two strands to the braid on one strand. And you want to say that that kind of, uh, you know, that's invariant for this closure of this braid is the same as invariant for this braid. And that's literally this Markov move. And the theorem of Markov uh, is that if you have invariant, which is a like, trace, which is this relation, you get an invariant of the uh, closure of the brain. And Joe's actually have shown that uh, if you impose these conditions, you know, you can ignore even the second one. So then there is essentially, there is only one trace. So it's unique. So the uh, Acniano Jones trace is unique. Sorry, should that be a trace? I mean, I didn't, I didn't write here, like, it's some kind of formula, some kind of uh, wreath and kind of number of the strands. You would never be, rem you would never remember that anyway. But should that be a trace of the tau? It's a trace, no, it's a, it's a trace of tau, yeah, sorry. This is the cross it out, cross of tau, trace of tau, yeah. Yeah, and the statement is that if you take this trace and up to some normalization, you get the Johnson or the... Yeah. 
yeah it's it's true for any aim so it's true for any, and actually the the trace itself takes uh, takes uh, takes coefficients in these uh, rational functions of aq that's the setting of the problem I mean, and you can show that there's unique trace of this which is kind of a fun statement you know i recommend this paper it's very elementary and fun okay so uh, what is going on so you know like uh, as yeah he did you know so basically you know he his construction is, di is different from the construction of this other people so he basically look at the traces the other people looked at the skein relations and you know the Jones's paper is uh, really amazing it contains a lot of the info a lot more than this so, you know, so for example this picture which I drew here it's already essentially in a Jones paper in 1987 he just didn't talk it on these terms but uh, uh, if he ignores this side, if you if you talk about this, so if you if you if you ignore this corner, then a rest of it was there. So because uh, what he did actually, he said, well, we have a Hecke algebra, right? This is a Hecke algebra. It's actually uh, it is an algebra. It's just the sum of the matrix algebras, the endomorphism of reusable representations. And if you have a, this Jones, if you you have this Jones Akniano trace, which goes from this algebra into this uh, into this algebra. And uh, on the other hand, we know that there are some kind of, uh, there are many choices of traces. There are many traces. They all come from the characters. So basically, the center of the Hecke algebra encodes all possible traces. So in particular, uh, this Akniano Jones trace is some kind of magical linear combination of elements here. There's some kind of magical element that encodes this trace. And he computes it. He computes it in terms of this, uh, you know, uh, he, for each partition, he writes a coefficient for this element. And if you look what's written there, these coefficients are literally localization coefficient of Hilbert scheme of points on C2. That's already there. And, uh, and you know, if you ignore this part, that was not in his paper. Then the rest of it was already in his paper in 1987. And uh, um, what we did with left, we made it a little bit harder. So we kind of said that, well, you know, you could say that, you know, if you look back, so the Jones's story was oh, sorry. This is kind of it was about only uh, a covariant story of Hilbert scheme C two with respect to only one C star action, but we know there are like two C star section or action on C. So how you upgrade it? Well, it gets a little bit harder. So that's that's what we did. So well, it turns out that you have to replace this Hecke uh, algebra by this uh, uh, Zergul bimodules, and you know here you would get this Greenfield center of the category of uh, Zergul bimodules. And here you get this matrix factorization, which I will explain. And you know, because you upgraded your C star action, you get richer invariant instead of you know, you get one more grading. That's that's how you can explain, you know, in simple terms, in elementary terms, what we have done. So I guess this part is probably the most unelementary, which I will Yeah, it just stretches the coordinates. Yeah, so the the first one, the the one which which uh, which Jones knew about. Sorry, I'm kind of getting confused. Uh, this one is just uh, it preserves symplectic form. That, that one stretches uh, the coordinates in opposite direction. Okay. That one is a good action and it's kind of most elementary one. So in this picture, the measurement trace you have to trace all the same for each a. It's independent of a. Yeah, it's independent of a. A is encoded here, so the 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 one more grading. So you know this. Uh, you know, you have this uh, uh, pathological vector bundle, and you can compute its weights in the localization, and that's where the A comes from. You mentioned this space, uh, or which one? Maybe ask me what is the dimension of this space? This space is a is number of partitions. It's a you know, there is a, yeah number of partitions. This like it, it, this dimension of the space is exactly. The dimension of K series of the Hilbert scheme of points on C2. So, and if you match them, then you see that it's all in Jones's already. Okay. All right, so we did this. And now we'll explain pieces of it. So, basically, you know, in the most elementary terms, what we did, we constructed for each uh, braid, we constructed coherent shift in Hilbert scheme of points on C2. And um, and you know this uh, this map has a various interesting properties. So basically, um, so you, yeah, I constructed like two periodic complex of coherent shifts on Hilbert C two. 
So with the property that if I compute uh, its homology, that's computation of homology, twisted by some vector bundle, I get isotopy invariance of the braid, closure of the braid. And second, there are a bunch of other properties. If I add to the full, twi uh, full twist to this braid, I get like tendering by some line bundle. And for example, uh, it's kind of clear that if your if closure of your braid is a knot, then there is some kind of a, a symmetry on this on this shift. So basically, there is like there are two coordinates in C two. You can flip them around, switch them around, and the shift would not change. And in particular, that was a big conjecture. It was a 15 year old conjecture that these conflict homologies have this symmetry, and we see it like immediately. You know? Sorry, under which condition is there symmetry? Well, if, if it's a knot. Because oh, if it's. Uh, there is some kind of more general statement for the links, but I don't want to write it. So there is a similar state. There is something for slightly more complicated. And we have. Oh, oh, I can see. Here, the only time you can see the kind of no, it's not. It's, it's not exactly. the the problem is that if you. Yeah, it would get. Yeah, you can. There is more general symmetry. What, what Min is referring is that there is a kind of more general theory. Uh, if you um, if you study, if you look at the case of uh, uh, like supergroups or something, then there is this analog of the statement. But the. Uh, the statement would be that you kind of you have to also change the color, so you kind of you switch symmetric but it's anti-symmetric. And what Mina is saying that in this case it's a it's a fundamental representation and it's kind of self-dual. Absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yes. That's, so, so your great closure is leading in the atlas. You will see. So I will explain it from the physics perspective. You know, you should ask why Hilbert's came to of C two and stuff like that. But the point is to explain how you see that. So and. You know, we had this conjecture, I had conjectures like this, uh, like in 2010, and I gave talks in uh, uh, Montreal, and I was lucky that Left was an audience, and he said, well, it's, it's elementary, it's in HILP-C2, it just immediately follows from brazansky witten theory. And then we talked and we made it work, so, but basically, he kind of immediately said that it should have physical explanation. Sorry, what was the last line? Yeah, the last line you can compute, well, I'll show examples for some, Easy braids, you can compute these uh, shifts explicitly. You know, you could say, what what is what is the series good for? It's good for uh, for computations actually. So you know, for some easy classes of braids, in general, I suspect that it would be easy to compute it for the algebraic braids. You know, for something that you take a knot and you start like cabling it. For those, uh, you should be able to compute this shift explicitly. But in general, it's kind of hard. You know, you cannot. You know, it's some shift. We know we construct the shift, but computing it explicitly is a kind of hard problem. Yeah, there is uh, two gradings here. This one. Then there is one more grading here from this uh, uh, exterior power. Right. It's because of the matrix factorizations. Yeah. Yeah, it's a matrix factorization with potential zero. Yeah, it is a metric position. All right, so this is just Hilbert scheme. The rem a reminder for people, everybody has seen it. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah, what is the I? What's that? Yeah, I, what is the purpose of this? Over, yeah, because you want to have three gradings. So, you know, the one. Okay, so is the third this is the third grading, not cohomological. You ignore this one. This one is oh, not a grading. Okay. There is some kind of people, people like to talk about force grading, but I think it's red herring. So you can say it's a force grading, but it's not. I think you, you can introduce the grading, but it's not going to be invariant with respect to the topological moves. So, you, you know, this space is a written naturally has four gradings, but only three gradings get preserved by the Markov move. So, you know, but that's why you ignore, we ignore this grading, this grading we ignore, we take total sum. Yes, it's very much unlike like Havana thing. So the Havana, the homological grading would be this. That would be homological grading, this, this exterior power, which is, yeah, it's very much not like that. That's right. Okay, questions? Okay, great, thanks. Can you keep asking questions? It's really. No, I mean, you know, last time, uh -huh. I, I, I thought about homology. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, so in some, some sense it's kind of a little bit more natural. I will maybe mention it. So this construction is slightly more natural um, because like, now you will see it. So basically, um, uh, all right, that's, um, that's the Hilbert scheme, right? So, you know, you can think about Hilbert scheme of points on C2 as a, some natural compactification of the symmetric power of C2 resolved. So you take sim C2 and resolve it, you get Hilbert C2. And uh, um, I introduced a bunch of notations, which I will use later. So there is a map from the uh, Hilbert C2 to the symmetric power, which just remembers the support of the quotient. And, you know, the Z, uh, that's notation for this functional Hilbert scheme. That's basically like where uh, it's the, the locus where like points stuck together. And there is a natural vector bundle of rank N on Hilbert C2, uh, which is basically, you know, for the ideal I, we take this quotient, which is N-dimensional by definition. Uh, and, you know, it, it's a vector bundle. It's a vector bundle of rank N. It's called sometimes tautological bundle. And I take dual of it and I got B. Right? So, and this is the C star action, C star cross C star, and the due section on C of C2. And, and we got grading on each homology group. All right, so this is like simplest example. If, you, if it's two points, then it's an, it's an object which probably most of you have seen. So it's the cotangent to P1 times C2, and it's a resolution of the, uh, you know, this quotient times C2. And for N equals three, it's more complicated. All right, so then I want to explain where, where we get braids. So in the, there's some other uh, construction. That's the initial construction of Havanov and Rozanski. It's more precisely like a construction by Havanov, who used Zergul bimodules. And he studied this like bimodules, Zergul bimodules, which is basically you fix, uh, you know, you fix polynomial ring and, and variables. And, uh, you know, and you kind of define some natural bimodules, which is kind of, yeah. Yeah. Why is the I grading associated with that? Mm -hmm. Why it's associated to A? Yeah, so I can explain. So this, this the question was about this. Yeah. Because somehow um, this grading is supposed to be kind of in string theory, you would have some kind of a um, you construct basically essentially two Lagrangians inside of this conifold, mm -hmm. one of them from the knot, and then they have zero section of your conifold, and you they intersect. And you want to kind of see, put some kind of D2 brains between these two Lagrangians. And these D2 brains uh, would be essentially like basic. Uh, on, on, on the, sort of the, the S2 side of the console, I have one Lagrangian which is not the body brain. Right. And it's geometry that's known about it. And then we're just like, yeah. Okay, the, the, the class of, of P1. Is... Right, right, right. The, the A would be counting how many uh, you know, D2 brains go along P1. Yeah, exactly. So and then uh, you can, and uh, that encoded in this case, because, you know, on the, if you apply, you know, you do string theory, then you can do this uh, gromov beaten DT correspondence, and you try to explain things on the, on the shift side, on PT side. But uh, it's also about the Zilberg scheme. The Zilberg scheme corresponds to, so, you're not just studying a conflict, you're studying P. Like, there's no P1 there. If you're, if you're thinking right, there is no P1. P, 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 uh, P, uh, P, uh, P1, you know, you, you talk about P1 because you want to embed the whole picture inside of the conifold. And this, uh, well, later I will show this three-dimensional TQFT, but it sits inside of the conifold. It's basically like, you know, you take one of the fibers of conifold, and inside of it, you have some three-dimensional space, and that's where your topological, theory, topological field theory lives. And, uh, and, you know, the explanation for this, I only know how to explain it using gromov beaten PT crystals. Because and it only would work for, for the beta, which is kind of algebraic knot coming from the curve. Then you have this gromov beaten PT thing. And there, this exterior power uh, appears naturally because you know, there's uh, uh, you know, degrees of uh, A along P1 on PT side would count some kind of X between two shifts. And then you see this thing appearing naturally. That's the best I can do with this, but there is no, uh, I, purely in terms of string theory, I don't know how I should. Okay, questions? Okay, so um, let me connect to this picture. So the one picture, so this is the usual story. That's what uh, was discovered by Havanov and Rozanski in 2006. So they said that 
you study this uh, simple object, which is polynomial ring, and inside of it is this, like, you have this um, bimodules, which is basically, this is like a subring invariant with respect to permutation k and k plus one. And that gives you this Zergel bimodule, or so-called. And uh, Rukia constructed a realization of the braid group in the, in the category, in the, the homo, basically, in, in a homotopy category of uh, complexes of Zergel bimodules. So basically, you take uh, these guys, you take some kind of possible tensor products, you extract all possible uh, kind of uh, uh, direct summons, and you construct complexes from these things, and you get the braid group. So, uh, in uh, how to say it, if you want a kind of more conceptual understanding of this Zergel bimodules, uh, there would be exactly n factorial objects of there, and the kind of categorization of the Hecke uh, category. So basically, the category of the uh, K series of the uh, category Zergel bimodules of size of n factorial, and that's just categorization of braids. And you know the theorem of Razansky, uh, that's what Mina is saying. So that A grading appears here as homological grading, indeed. Uh, and you know what you do? You do this like a uh, Rukia complex attached to beta, and you take its Hochschild homology, which is like a closure, and you extract its uh, homology. And the three grading comes from one from this homological grading, another one from Hochschild grading. Then you also have a, a C star action, uh, C star action uh, on the on the polynomials. You can rescale all of the variables. That's the third grading. And I want to point out that you know I, I showed you in the other slide that there is a symmetry between this this uh, Hochschild grading and this uh, uh, homological grading, which is absolutely not obvious in this model because you know, they have completely different nature. But now, sorry, it's clear. Okay, let me explain how the braids appear. That, yeah. So can I go back one slide? Yeah. What's the homotopy category of this LRT? As beam? This? This one? Uh, that you take uh, complexes of uh, constructed of this uh, of this uh, Karubi envelopes of possible tensor products of this, uh, and you study these complexes up to homotopy. There are some subtleties you, you do not consider derived category of this uh, S beam, because if you consider derived category, you know, your, your crossing will disappear. So, but uh, it's just it's just this, the most Naive construction, just complexes up to homotopy. It's a triangulated category and has all of the nice homological properties. Okay. Which can have modular homotopy. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's it. You don't. If you invert quasi isomorphism, then you know undercrossing will become the same as our overcrossing. That was something that people didn't like. And for example, in our construction, we don't have this. You know, in our cases, everything is actual derived category. There's no I don't know. Okay, so how do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You, you have a, it says a semi-infinite amount of time, so it's not worry about time. Mm -hmm. um, so. I don't understand. Is, the fact that you say the degree of the, uh, the mm -hmm. uh, t is the degree of what? Uh, yeah, it, it's probably bad notation. So I mean that degree. No, no, this is correct. So this the t is no, it's correct. T is a. There is like, you know, in, if you read papers in this uh, home flip PT homology, there is a Q, T, and A yeah. gradings. So the T grading is this one. The Q grading is this one. So T grading is homological grading. T is homological grading, yes. Uh, and, and then A is? A is a grading that comes from, uh, from this. It's a Hochschild grading. So, and, you know, it's always fine because if you have a, why it's fine is because, you know, the polynomial, stuff over the polynomial can, Ring has a finite resolution of length n. So, in particular, from this construction, you immediately see that you know the A grading cannot be more than n if it's like on n strands. Yeah, please ask questions. So you know, I'm not in a rush. Okay. All right. Let me explain how we construct the braid action. So uh, you will see it in a second. So, um, so the you know. The most common way to construct the braid action in the um, in geometric representation theory to study this Steinberg variety. What is the Steinberg variety? The Steinberg variety is a basically a triple of two flags F and F prime, and the matrix uh, matrix is a uh, new potent actually, and the condition is that you know X preserves both of the flags, so it sits inside of the product flag times flag times GLN. And here I did the example when n is equal to, 
So it, that n should be two. Uh, and it is actually a pretty simple object. You know, that's, let me explain what's going on. So the, this element x, if it's zero, so two case, that means we don't impose any conditions on the flags. That means we got this part, p1 cross p1. Another option when x is new potent but not zero, that, that means a Jordan normal form. It's a, you know, this, you know, zero, one, one, zero, zero, and preserve only one flag. That means that both flags are equal. Uh, then, you know, then you also have, uh, you know, this new potent element is defined up to scaling. That's why I have extra direction and you got this cotangent to P1. So this uh, Steinberg for n equal two is just uh, uh, the P1 cross P1, cotangent to P1 glued together along the diagonal. So inside of P1 cross P1, you have a diagonal and you just basically attach this guy. That's very simple object. There's two components and they glue along the diagonal, as I said. So how you would want to construct the braid action? Well, ah, I did I explain it. So yeah, that's, uh, okay, I'll show you the complex in a second, how you construct this thing. So uh, what, what was shown by Bezrukovnikov and Rich, and we kind of proved it in a different way in our paper, is that you can realize the um, braid group inside of this coherent shifts, GLN and coherent coherent shifts on the standard right. So, um, and you know, what we show in even paper with Razansky is left is that if you take this realization and uh, you impose some stability condition, which I will say in a second. So, you know, that's the first order approximation of Dunsford. You realize the braid, identity braid, and you construct the home. And that's the isotope invariant. Okay. So let me, I'll come back to the statement in, in, in a few slides. All right, so now let me talk about how you realize braid. Uh, you know, there's algebraic story. Remember I talked about this uh, Zergl bimodules and that was like special Zergl bimodules. Sorry, yeah. No, no, he'll just scheme. He, yeah, yeah, what happened on the previous slide. So yeah, so that you will see the Hilbert scheme. Um, it's hard to see Hilbert scheme from this perspective, from the coherent shift side, uh, because um, it's some kind of a, Steinberg appears as some kind of a um, Kazool dual picture for the matrix vectorization. I will, I will write it when I talk about matrix vectorization. But here it's kind of hard to see how the, why matrix, why Hilbert schemes appear. But uh, it's, it's not immediately clear. So, uh, okay, maybe you can tell us um, what, what physically is the Yeah, what, this one. Ah, yeah, this, what's happening here? That's uh, um, the, the Steinberg, you know, the Steinberg is a quiver writing. No, people like, rarely talk about it, but it's actually is a quiver writing. That's a quiver writing, which I'm sure you like. So one, two, three, for example, four, one, that's the standard. And you know, and you have a braid action on this object and is the polynomial gauge or not? What? The polynomial gauge or not? It's not gauged. It's not gauged. So and you know the picture which would appear in a few slides, you know, you'd have some kind of defects where the you know, numbers go from like a four, three, two, one, zero, and we basically like take this slice and that's how you got this quiver. So you know, that's you know that's this two dimension. I'll draw the picture. But it, this is the flag. This is one flag. This is another flag. This is the moment map, and we just equate them. Yeah, the Steinberg. Steinberg is a you know Steinberg. You could say it's a cotangent to to the flag. So yeah. So now you're trying to explain physically what's happening at infinity of these two things. Right. That's what Spencer is saying. So you have the two moment maps and you equate them and that's actually the standard. So if I understand correctly, you projected that uh, the Markov trace onto a plane. Right, and then you think what that projection as some kind of diagonal inside uh, two plus and as defining some kind of diagonal itself inside two plus and two plus 
Mm -hmm. Right, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. That's right. But how are you going to do that with the rest of the formal paper? How do I glue what? How are you going to glue that to whatever is happening on the, on the, on the, so this is what's happening in the infinity of the two brains. Right. What's happening in, at the is still is very important, right? Yes, yes, yes. I'll talk about what happened in infinity is important. That kind of would move us between different uh, not homologies, actually. Yes, it's important. So, sorry, I didn't write the picture correctly. It should be from zero to n. So, this is a zero, one, two, three, n, three, three, four. And then you can do stuff here, so which I'll explain later. But now this is the picture. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is a Rukia picture. So basically, uh, geometrically, if you want to like explain this uh, bezerukovnik frisch construction, it does the following thing. So you take, as I told you, like Steinberg on two strands has two components. It has a cotangent P1 sitting inside of it, and you have a whole Steinberg. And you can always take a function on the Steinberg and restrict it to this uh, piece. And you got a complex, three-step complex. And then there is some kind of natural uh, kind of dual complex, which you can guess what it is. But, you know, exercise and uh, but an interesting thing that you know this uh, uh, category of the Steinberg variety itself has a natural convolution product because it's like you know two copies you know this uh, this and this but you can write triple product of this then it gives you a way of con convolving objects and but that, uh, this is the the generators of the braid I'm explaining you how you would realize the overcrossing and undercrossing this is overcrossing this is undercrossing. So and they realize by this thing. Okay, and um, and you know we proved that actually this uh, Zergel construction matches with our geometric construction from the previous slide. And how you prove it? Well, we just uh, uh, you know. We... Sorry, can you again say what you're doing there? I mean, you were somehow modeling. Um... Yeah, I want to model. You know, that's what you're saying. Yeah, I, I'm just as you know, it is this complex. It looks very much like a Rukia complex. And that's exactly the proof. So basically, we say that this is also the unit. You know, this is like analog of this R. Do you remember the Zergel bimodal story was the, this? So this Zergel bimodal did I write for you? The generators? Oh no, it's on the next slide. Oh, sorry. Here's Zergel bimodal. So it's related overcrossing and undercrossing. And they're like you know, R, which is like a diagonal, and this is some kind of interesting object. That's like you know, Steinberg, analog of the Steinberg. And this one is the other way around. So, and it turns out that geometrically it's just the same pictures, you know, that's, you see, we just compare these two, they're kind of identical. Sorry, I don't know what steps, I thought R is supposed to be the structure tree. Right, the structure tree that's sitting diagonal, and it's unit in the bimodal product structure. If I have a, so, you know, the, the bimodulus is just basically, you're looking at the, uh, so, you know, what's bimodulus? It's like R, it's modulus over R and R. So, and inside of here, uh, so basically you have a left and right action of R, but if you say that left and right actions are the same in its R, then it's a unit. You know, the natural, the, the monoidal structure of bimodules is natural. You just take a tender product. If you have a bimodule, you have like module M, which is a left and right action. So then, you know, you can multiply, tender multiply it with R and R. And you get a new object and that's you know the reason why it's you know it's so elementary and it's, that's why it's so attractive a lot of people think about zergel bimodules because it, you can explain it to like high school how to construct zergel bimodules and uh, in particular you know you have a special bimodule which is uh where you know basically it's a you know let's say it's x variables and x prime variables and you take uh r r x prime r x prime Tender by the condition that these two are equal. That's the unit. And that's what I wrote here. This is R. And this is some other object. Anyway, so that's, that's how you see that come out. These two pictures should match. All right, so and that's what I wrote for you. Well, you know, now I have to correct myself slightly because I kind of lied to you. So all the way up to here. Because well, this object is really not well defined. So, because uh, the standard variety is singular and it's badly singular, and you cannot talk about you can talk about derived category of uh, something singular, but 
you wouldn't like what you will get. So, uh, and the correct story is like you have to study the uh, derived category of the ambient space, which is smooth, but to impose some kind of support conditions on your object. So and basically you say that you study the coherent complex of coherent shifts on this space, uh, such that they support it on the Steinberg variety. And so that's the, that's the correct statement. And now we, we get, finally get to the metric equalization. Here it is. So now I claim that this, uh, the correctly defined uh, category of the Steinberg variety is actually the category of the metric factorizations. How do you see that? So the, the metric factorization uh, has you know, the ambient space, which is two copies of cotangent flux plus times GLN. And here is the potential. We have the moment map from this space and moment map from this space times, you know, it's element of GLN times X trace. Okay, so, so why is that? So, you know, most of people don't like metric factorization, which is okay, so I can, uh, and, uh, but I can show you that how you can at least make some piece with that. So, uh, okay, that's the definition, which looks kind of weird, and I don't know, why would you do that? So, and it was the first appeared in the Eisenbach's work, who was studying actually kind of a, uh, Maximal coin Macaulay modules over the hypersurface defined by W. Kind of, why would you care about it? So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, he's a, he was the director of MSRI. It's a really important problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, uh, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful work. I should really, I recommend you looking at this. And, uh, so then actually uh, Konsevich uh, brought it up and said it's relevant for like a, it's, it models like a B more, it, it, it's good for modeling B, uh, B, more, uh, B models. And it was later developed by uh, Orlov. So this you know, the, kind of the, the big renaissance in matrix optimization probably due to Orlov. And this is like an example of matrix optimization. All right, so looks, still looks a little bit strange. So, okay, here was kind of my, might help to kind of make peace with that. Suppose your potential not crazy, so it has a kind of special property that should be fi. Sorry, that's, I forgot i here. It's linear in some sets of variables. Okay, suppose you have this. Then it turns out that this matrix factorization category is equivalent to category of uh, uh, to the derived category of the zero locus of this uh, uh, f. So in some sense, uh, you should think about the matrix factorization in this situation uh, as this. And, uh, and actually, we are exactly in the situation. So let's look at this potential. It's clearly linear on X. So you can apply this here, and we will get that this measure, you know, the metric position on this space uh, is actually equivalent to the coherent shifts on a space defined by this equation, which is, this, which is exactly Steinberg. So this is Steinberg is defined by this equation, and we get back to what we've seen before. All right, so it's great, looks, looks nice. Looks nice and it seems like we haven't done anything new compared to this, uh, to this uh, Steinberg story. But you will see something new in a second. But any questions so far? All right, but you know, one, one, uh, one thing I should say that uh, the correct statement here is it should be DG. So sometimes these equations are not transverse, then the matrix factorization tells you the correct thing to do with that. No. It also, you know, it's a kind of correct derived object. Okay, so, okay, here are the flags, Hilbert schemes appearing now. So let's, let me explain how it appears. Um, uh, all right, so, so we have a matrix factorizations on this space. Right? So we have potential. So inside of here, you can embed diagonally, uh, we can do something strange. We can uh, realize, we take this smaller space, uh, it's, upper triangular, strictly upper triangular, and, uh, uh, and GLN, why GLN? So GLN is because we think about this uh, um, cotangent to flag group element and Y. So this, this is the realization. So the point is that like if you restrict, if you substitute this coordinates in the potential, then it turns into zero. So that's, um, sorry, I'm not saying that. So, that, okay. so I kind of, kind of fast track forward and to explain how you get the uh, Hilbert schemes. So the, uh, the best way to see is to see, to see that, you know, if you pull back the potential along this uh, uh, embedding, you'll get something like this. 
And in, if you assume that your group element is kind of close to identity, uh, you get potential like this. This is your potential, plus some corrections. But now we can apply our Kazoo duality. This is linear on Xi. And now we get a condition, if you take derivative of this, uh, you know, of this potential with respect to Xi, you get exactly condition that two matrices commute X and Y. And actually these two matrices like upper triangular. So you know, that was the, and that's how you get a true flag Hilbert scheme. So you know, the flag Hilbert scheme, it's just a pair of matrices X and Y, and X is upper triangular, Y is strictly upper triangular, and they commute. And there is, and there is a stability condition that these two matrices uh, generate everything. And in it, and it's equivalent to this, basically the, um, you can always project from the flag Hilbert scheme to the usual Hilbert scheme. What do you do? Well, you just take your uh, cyclic vector here and you start applied polynomials of X and Y. And if polynomial kills this vector V, um, we say it sits inside of the ideal. So this all of the set of all Fs such that satisfy these equations is an ideal. And actually it gives you the map from the flag Hilbert scheme to the usual Hilbert scheme. Okay, maybe, you know, it's kind of for mathematicians, you know, that's, that's how you kind of get from the metric factorizations uh, to the Hilbert scheme. So, and here I kind of imp implicitly using this table piece of the metric factorization, which I will say in a few seconds. That's roughly how you go from the, uh, the Steinberg to the Hilbert scheme. So let me repeat the steps. You start with Steinberg. It's equivalent to some kind of a, a metric factorizations. So uh, then what you do, you kind of uh, pull back uh, the metric factorization to the special sub variety, which is like roughly closing of the braid. And then you linearize your potential. Then you apply causal duality again, but with respect to different, different variables, and then you get a flag Hilbert scheme, then you can project it to the usual Hilbert scheme. All right, so that's. Right, this is a kind of like, a, that's, this is this, this uh, pullback, it's like a closure of the braid. Um, let me move on to like physics part. So I don't think you would like, you know, you're liking this, you know, the formula, so like this, you know, you will see the better explanation why Hilbert scheme in a second. Because it's just a, uh, the rough sketch of the, what, what's going on. So now you have to explain a lot of things, you know, why you can ignore this. You have to explain that. It's, it's possible to explain that. Maybe you can help again. Uh, so the output of this is from this. Are you going to get some from the Yes, that's, what, that's the construction. So. Yeah, so I told you, like, you know, I, I took a braid and I used the Bizarokovnik of Rish or our version of the construction to construct metric factorization here. Then I do this construction, you know, do this uh, bunch of steps. I pull back this element to the special sub, sub variety. Then I project and I get this shift. Now it's a shift on Hilbert scheme of points on C2. That's the construction. So, and, uh, right. Anyway, so maybe I'll skip this, you know, this is the kind of about. Okay, now we're going going to the physics. This is the physics. All right. So let let well, let me try to explain what it has to do with physics. What actually Lev had in mind when he told me that you know it should be elementary. So that's his explanation, essentially. So um, there is some kind of a three D sigma model uh, with the source. You know, you start with R two times S one, and the defects in this uh, series would be like our braid times S one. So you will see a picture in a second, such that if you evaluate this partition function on the two dimensional slice, it's like R2 times a point, you get a vector space. And this vector space would be exactly this, uh, this triple graded homology. So, and uh, you know, this is a topological 3D sigma model. And it's an example of this Kapustin, Saul, and Rosansky EQFT, which is Rosansky written series with defects, which I will say if you want. Okay, just a reminder about 3D TKFT, right? 3D TKFT would uh, attach to uh, like three manifold a number to like a surface inside of the vector space. And, you know, if you have a three manifold with the boundary, then it would attach some kind of a um, tensor product of the, um, uh, of the bound of the vector spaces attached to this. 
and you have a close sur a close connected surface then it would be uh, would attach a category and the surface with the boundary it would attach an element inside of this uh, category this is the usual uh, assumptions and to a point uh, we attach you know it would be uh, we attach a two category and you know to interval we attach some kind of a the morphism between the uh, two no sorry to a point we attach some kind of a uh, object in two category and you know if you have an interval connecting two points we have two different objects and then you would get some kind of morphism between them so yeah, yeah. sure um, for the s one mm -hmm. Um, maybe I'll, I'll S1 is the S1 along the grade? No, S1 goes transverse direction. So let me show you a picture. Maybe I'll show you a picture. I drew a picture. I spent time. So I'll go back to this in a second, but let me show you a picture. So the picture here. All right, so this is the picture. So that's what that's picture. This is like ambient three dimensional space. And uh, we have like some kind of a defect, which is like a, a you should, this green cylinder is defect. And you know, on uh, you can say that on uh, on the cylinder you have like you know the line defect which encodes your braid. And basically, uh, in outside of cylinder, in, in out and in inside there are two different uh, uh, series. So inside of the you know cylinder you have this uh, something, some kind of sigma model with the three D sigma model with target hilp C two outside. So this is like a, this is a. Uh, I don't know, Series with defects, you know, inside of each connected component, they have its own topological field theory. So, you know, and you mean your, your cylinder is a, is, a, is a boundary of a, of a, of a, of a right, right, right. So, I'll, I'll, I will explain it like I'll go back and explain it in, 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 uh, in slides. So, basically, so you're saying at every point on the disk, you have a different yes, and at every point inside so of here. So the correct thing is if I take a small circle inside of here, inside of cylinder, so by three uh, topological three fields here that tell you that you should attach a category to this thing, right? So you have a circle inside of the three manifold. It should be a category. This category would be coherent shifts on Hilp C2. That's just, that's usual radonsky witten series. So basically radonsky witten So let me go back. I'll go back to this radonsky witten series and explain. Did I go or not? So let me explain. I'll just remind the Razansky Witten story. So this is Razansky Witten story. The Razansky Witten story is a. It's so the three D series we'll be studying is a pair on three D series. Ah, uh, that should be three D. That's that's right. That's the three. That's what it would be at the end. Okay. Right. And now. Uh, the pair was was uh, yeah, Higgs branches. Uh, I guess to our That's right. Exactly. That's the um, Higgs branch. And uh, and now the two Hilbert schemes again, the Hilbert scheme that that uh, C times C, uh, I mean, of course, with the, with the C two times the C action, mm -hmm. from your perspective, is a Higgs or a Kohlberg? It's Higgs. Okay, so well, Rosanski Witten was uh, well, it was kind, of, it kind of appeared. That's the Hilbert scheme. Right, mm -hmm. right. As Lev told me, though, this uh, this. Uh, Apparently, Witten gave talk, a series of talk and, uh, talks in Oxford, where he introduced, first of all, like this Rosansky Witten series. Then he talked about Hanani Witten series. And I, for I forgot, it was some, and I think Cyber Witten. So it was some kind of really, really spectacular event when he introduced all of the series at the same time. So, and uh, uh, I will be talking only about Rosansky Witten series, but apparently they appeared at the same time. All right, so the Rosansky Witten series is like, you know, just a sigma model. You just study. Uh, maps of from the three manifold into the X, where X is supposed to be hyperkeller or more generally high, uh, holomorphic symplectic. And you know the fields are you know your maps plus some bunch of other auxiliary fields, which I'm not sure you know, would be helpful for anybody to see. And you kind of a uh, I I have extra slides where I wrote this Lagrangians. They're essentially some kind of um, you know, odd version of the you know some kind of Version of the Chern Simon. Um, yes, exactly. So, uh, and that's a theory without uh, any, no, no defect here. So, it's just a usual three manifold. And basically, you know, if you evaluate 
uh, this partition on three manifold, you get some kind of topological invariant of M. That's what it was. You know, some kind of facility of that invariant. All right. So now uh, what uh, later on appeared, so in papers of Rosanskin, uh, so, like Kapustin, Rosanskin, Saulina, that looked in the case where your uh, M have a boundary. Suppose it has a boundary, then uh, I didn't say it in the previous slide, but you know, this, uh, uh, this Lagrangians, which I didn't write for you, have supersymmetry. And supersymmetry forces this map uh, phi to collapse two points. Actually, you know, even though it's a sigma model, it's actually B model. So basically, because of supersymmetry, this map is actually trivial. And at the end of the day, as shown in the paper of Rosanskin Witten, you know, you, you know, this, this, you know, this integral descends on some finite dimensional computation, which is computation of, you know, of the some kind of product of the uh, copies of the, uh, this hyperkeller manifold. It's because of the supersymmetry. And, uh, uh, and, you know, if you don't have any boundary, then, you know, the, this, uh, the image of this phi could be any point on X because there is no boundary. So then the problem which, you know, Kapustin, Azansky, and Saulian solved, they kind of looked at the case where uh, M has a boundary. Okay, and, uh, you know, first order approximation, you can think about some surface times R, and then actually they kind of look to this possible infinite dimensional space. And if they would look at the uh, condition that is imposed by supersymmetries. You want this, uh, um, how would I say it? You want this uh, kind of a sigma model with boundaries also have the supersymmetry condition. Then from the condition that uh, uh, supersymmetry is preserved, they derive that the image of the, uh, of the boundary of M should be inside of some kind of holomorphic Lagrangian. So that was kind of motivation for introducing, for introducing uh, this KRS model. And, you know, it's, it's actually pretty mathematical. It's mathematical computation. It's kind of, it's a mathematics. You know, how this, this, year, this is a theorem. It's not just speculation. So, okay, so then, and okay, they, then they say, well, we tried to kind of model this, uh, 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 the 3D sigma model with boundaries by kind of analogy with Foucault category. So Foucault category is 2D sigma model. And now we want to do 3D sigma model. And they say, well, the object in our 3D sigma model would be a holomorphic Lagrangians inside of our holomorphic symplectic variety together with some vibrations. So why vibration? Well, because, um, you know, in usual Foucault category, you have a local system on Lagrangians. And uh, in our case, we kind of want to go one categorical level up and now we say that's kind of holomorphic Lagrangian together with the local system of categories. So not just the vector spaces, but categories. And you should think about this vibration as, some, as a local system of categories. So now you have some kind of arbitrary vibration sitting over the Lagrangians. And actually in their paper, they say it should be Calabiao vibrations. Uh, but then they kind of abandoned it. So, and, uh, you know, so you kind of drop it. Up. So, okay. So here's like, you know, extraction of the uh, of the series. So basically, we will want to construct some kind of a three category where the objects are holomorphic symplectic manifolds. Okay. Uh, the, what are the morphisms between uh, this uh, symplectic holomorphic? Symplectic? Well, the object would be you take a, a Lagrangian, holomorphic Lagrangian inside of the product of them together with the vibration of the Lagrangian. That's the, that's the, uh, Morphism between two holomorphic symplectic varieties. Okay, so now yeah, I need to define you what is a morphism. Uh, suppose we have a composition. We want to write a composition between this is home from X to Y, this is home from Y times W. Well, what you do, some kind of do like a fiber product. That's what they say. You intersect Lagrangians and you intersect the fibers over the Lagrangian. Okay, so then, you know. Um, that's the definition. Let's keep going. And that's like fiber product. Uh, now you want to explain what is the uh, morphism between uh, morphisms. Uh, that's like a two cat. That's this was like you know it should be um, a category. So you know kind of because it's a morphism between objects of two category, it should be a, a category. And this is a category which is a derived fiber product. So this of this, this that's when the vibration come into play. And well, it's kind of complicated. In general, in our case, the uh, object, the target space would be this. It would be 
cotangent to the quotient GLN by, you know, the GLN by GLN by conjugation, which is the same as some kind of Hilbert scheme of points to be more precise, it's more like symmetric power of C2. That's like symmetric power of C2, but you can also do like some kind of stable piece so then you get Hilbert scheme. But as it is, this is like literally, this space is a symmetric power of, and symmetric power of C2. But if I impose stability condition would be, uh, okay, so it looks kind of too complicated. So here we have like a stable piece of C2. All right, so that, that was like physics motivation for the uh, left's proposal. Right, so it's, uh, maybe I will pause here for a second. So basically what we're doing, we're doing some kind of a, um, yeah, that's the, uh, that was the um, uh, explanation. How would you get Hilbert scheme? So Hilbert scheme, uh, you kind of put it in by hands. Right, it's obvious. Yeah, right. It's, it's, not, it's not exactly obvious why we would have some braids and the closure of the braids, I would say. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah, so that's. Um, uh, that was the explanation. That was his uh, proposal. You know, that's what he proposed to kind of do rigorously. And um, we'll go to some elementary stuff in a second. So, um, what is our Lagrangians? What are the interesting Lagrangians? So, you know, I, I gave you the holomorphic symplectic variety, which is the, the his, his Hilbert scheme. Now I need to give you some interesting holomorphic Lagrangians inside of it. Well, inside of uh, uh, what is the most interesting object inside of GLN. Well, nilpotent cone, that's like, it contains all of the representation series. If you understand nilpotent cone, you understand everything. So, uh, and what we do, what we, we take basically a um, uh, co-normal bundle uh, to the nilpotent cone. That's the Lagrangian. Um, sorry, I have two questions. Yeah. Right. That's and, the uh, which is which 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 should be the closest to the Lagrangian in the Hilbert scheme. Yes, I think that that would be reflected on that. You have to change. This is the case when V is just fundamental representation. It's probably extendable to other things, but you have to replace this by a more comp by a different object. You have to be different. Like it should be, it should be different Lagrangian, and it's probably doable. You know, you're talking about colored invariants, right? Suppose you want to do colored invariants. No, nah, it's probably doable. You know, basically you have to kind of work on this. You can work on the Steinberg side. It's clear what you need to do, but it's it's work. You have to check that some braid relations satisfy. It's not it's not something you want to do unless you have some good motivation. So yes, exactly. But that's all for the fundament, just fundamental. Right? So nothing uh, fancy happens. Um, Right, so more geometrically, you could say that this uh, Lagrangian is just, you know, you have a Hilbert scheme of points on C2. Inside of it, you have some kind of a, um, you know, you have a, on C2, you have coordinates X and Y, and we're only looking at the sub locus inside of this Hilbert scheme of the points which are kind of, uh, you know, which have support on Y, set theoretically. In particular, it could be, you know, if I draw your, you know, what is Hilbert scheme, which is like, you know, this is X and Y coordinates, and, you know, you, I could have like points which kind of stuck to the origin. That's, that's perfectly okay thing. You know, you could have like a points which kind of stick out infinitesimal from Y variable, but do not sit inside of it. And this Lagrangian is extremely singular. That's one thing I should say that you, know, you cannot just do usual Fukai stuff. It's very singular. You have to kind of come up with your own definitions. And I don't think there is a rigorous setting for that so far. Okay. So if you don't like Nilpotent corner, you can think about this. Uh, and it's it's actually quite singular. It has a lot of components. Why did I say? And there is a vibrations part of the story because I will skip it. So there's some interesting vibration, but okay, I'll, I'll keep it fine. So okay, so that's now now the pictures. Okay. So let me draw. So this is my this is my like uh, 3D sigma model. That's like you know my source of the maps. That's my where my topological series is happening. 
So in the picture here, you have like a braid uh, and you have like a cylinder of the fact. So, so my point about it was the same as well. You have this macro straight braid, but you decide to, to take, to have all the braids that take place at one point. Right. I, here's, I will expand it in a second, but now I want to draw like simplified picture, right? That's like, you know, where I kind of, you know, actually collapsed all of my NS5 brains into like one like thick uh, defect. So that it's okay. So then, you know, what happening, you know, here inside of, a, um, inside of the cylinder, I have this um, um, Rosansky Witten series with target Q of C2, and outside is, a, is just a point. It's n equals zero. It's not, not, it's not interesting. All right. And, uh, and on the boundary here, I put this, my, uh, I put my uh, Lagrangian, which I just described you. I told you this new button. <laughs> That's right. But then, uh, if you don't want to think of that as one of the boundary lines, because it isn't boundary line, you know, in the block. Uh, sorry. No, 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 no. You kind of break this M into pieces. No, actually, I said it completely wrong. Uh, if you're going to guard find stuff, there are two things to live on a street. And that's why you have this, that's right. Because right. Because at infinity uh, of the bit, you can find the bit. At infinity of the bit, you want to have one by the bit. Yeah, there's right. nothing in the field. You, 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 you can erase this thing. It's like empty. There's emptiness. It's complete. Yeah, it's it's emptiness. Right. It's like a de it's desert, you know, yeah, like an. Yeah, that's right. You want a disk with boundaries. Right. That's right. So, so it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's a desert, you know, basically a point, and you want a kind of uh, correspondence between HILP N and the point. That means you need to choose a Lagrangian inside of HILP C2, which I showed you in the previous page. And, uh, uh, and basically, uh, the B, the braid, would give you endomorphism of this object. So the braid gives you endomorphism of this object, which is kind of closely related to Steinberg, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So basically, um, the if you wanna, if I want to evaluate, so what's the what so what's F? F at some kind of it's a vibration, it's a vibration over it. So you know, I, I, I explained it on the previous. So why did I, you know, it's important to know the fibers because you know you get, you know, you get. Uh, Steinberg back from this vibration. I told you this is Lagrangian, but then there are some kind of fibers growing over this Lagrangian. And if you take the direct, direct self intersection of this thing, you discover back your Steinberg variety. So, you know, like just from Lagrangian, you would not be able to see your Steinberg. Steinberg kind of leaves on the fibers. That's, and you know, I, I kind of wrote your formulas, but I'm not sure how helpful they are. But, you know, you should think about it as like, fi uh, like vibrations over there. Um, you know, this vibration of the Lagrangian, they kind of, that's how you construct your braid action. So it kind of, if you don't have this extra vibration, you don't get braid. It kind of becomes boring. So that's what I was doing. So this is. Yeah, the Lagrangian. Is, that's right. There's not, there is no, Hilbert, in Hilbert scheme, in some sense, you already kind of average, you know, you, there is no group, you know, symmetric group action. You kind of symmetrize them. So you want to kind of, uh, uh, order them, and that's what Steinberg does for you. Steinberg kind of orders the eigenvalues, and that's this like it's encoded in this vibration story. So and so I'm just you know I'm saying it because I want to relate it back to this Rosansky witness theory. That's what in my slide I showed you what this endomorphism between this object into itself. That's exactly this, and you get Steinberg. So basically, you know, I told you that uh, the endomorphism of object into itself should be one category, and this one category in this case is literally coherent shifts on Steinberg. So, um, the, the data of the brain is roughly like, if you have Hilbert's scheme and his friends, the data of the brain is roughly the form. No, not quite. But it's no, it's you, right. you, you, you'll, see, you'll see this quiver in a second. So, okay. so that would be another picture which explains that. Okay, so that's the, that's the picture. As I said, you know, the, the partition function on the small disk around, uh, around this, you know, uh, this area would give you exactly the object, uh, which is, you know, the, how do I say this? The category of this circle, of this pink circle, is, a, is exactly the uh, Steinberg. And, you know, you, I fill this disk with something, and I fill it with a defect beta. This way I get an object inside of this uh, uh, category. And that subject is exactly what realizes your brain. 
Okay, so that's what I'm saying. So now, if I want to uh, kind of evaluate my partition function on the whole plane, that's like, you know, this is, then, then I should get a vector space. And the space should be what? So, you know, uh, it's a home between what's inside of the disk, just this part, together with what is outside. So, you know, basically, and what is outside is this object. So, you know, I, say, I told you that inside of this pink OL, you have this object. Outside, there is no braid, but there is this like special line defect, which I'll explain in a second. Sorry, you mean the outside of the pink, pink, yeah, pink circle? Yeah, outside of pink circle, you also it's also a disk, right? So and uh, and uh, but this disk has uh, only interesting defect is this in this like, special line defect which goes along as one. Nothing interesting mm -hmm. happening. And you know, I say that value on on the complement of this disk is, is this object is basically. Uh, you know, structure shift of the Hilbert scheme times this, um, uh, you know, this vector bundle. Okay. So now uh, that was a, um, well, how you see the Hilbert scheme story? So the Hilbert scheme story, I'm saying that, again, we have it's the same picture. There's like, you know, nothing here and they have a cylinder, but now I cut my like cylinder in this way. I draw this circle. So I kind of draw a circle around the defect. And as I told you, you know, like it's a 3D topological field theory to a like pink circle, we should attach a, a one category. And this one category is exactly category of coherence shifts on Hilbert C2. And, you know, I feel this entire, entire thing again with the line defect. And um, because of this, uh, so we have, uh, how to say, what I'm trying to say here that, again, you have a two disks, you have uh, these disks, inside of uh, a circle and outside. So outside of the circle, you again attach uh, objects inside of the, uh, here's the Hilbert scheme of points on C2, but it's a different one. It would depend on beta on the, on the braid. And for inside, you don't have like braid, and you only have this line defect. You attach to this, this object. And again, if you want to evaluate partition function on the whole plane, you have to take a home between uh, object and outside and object in and inside, and you get Another construction. And then there is a zero good picture, which is a little bit funny. So basically, now I do this. I take a, a, a I make a, a giant. Sorry, sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That was that was explanation for the Hilbert scheme. Yeah. The previous picture was explanation for the Steinberg. So you know here. I explain you how you see the Steinberg variety. Uh -huh, by cutting that, that way. That makes sense, right? right. So here was a home uh, on the Steinberg. On another picture was a oh, home okay. on Hilbert cool. scheme. So this way you kind of see, you know, left side is like you know uh, two categorical uh, Riemann row. So I because mean, that's right. Yeah. So you. Right. So then there is something that we don't fully understand. So you know, that's, you know, I, we understand it mathematically, but we don't understand it physically. So, uh, so basically to get this uh, Zergel bimodal picture, this algebraic picture, what you need to do, you need to do something strange. You kind of uh, 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 make, a, you punct, you, uh, you make a hole inside of your cylinder. You kind of puncture it. And you put like, you know, zero here, like, you know, point. And it turns out that uh, um, uh, this, you know, if I now again evaluate on this all, uh, I get um, I get this uh, um, complex of Zergel bimodules attached to the braid. I get the Rukia complex. It turns out that the Rukia complex needs to be attached to uh, to first of all, I, you know, the the category of the pink circle in this case would be different. It would be this. It would be simpler. It would be derived category of coherent shifts on C two cross C n cross C n. And the Zergel bimodules live there. And it turns out that you know, the object which you need to attach to the, the field disk is exactly this complex of Zergel bimodules. And for some reason, you know, and then you get back, you restore back the algebraic definition. But then we prove mathematically that this, uh, you know, the, the partition function on this picture is the same as on the previous slide, which is, I don't know, it's a little bit strange because physically it's a different picture. So here, we had like line defect in the middle. And in this picture, we have some kind of, we removed it, but I, that's, I just want to put it out in but case. You have to have that out for A somewhere, right? 
yeah, the A, uh, the A is kind of, uh, has a different role here. So here A kind of homological grading on this, on this other picture. So in other picture, in this one, the A is just this, it's just like this exterior powers. I don't know why. Huh. Okay, so that's, I just wanted to the picture. So now we want all to see this, this, this guy, right? The Higgs branch. Yeah. Yeah, I make a hole in it in the middle. So, you know. Yeah, it's empty set. It's inside of like, you know, you go from empty set to Hubert scheme to empty set back. It's, it's, so this one, you can say that, you know, how, how you think of that, so, you know, this, you can cut this uh, circle into two pieces, the one piece, another piece, then, uh, you know, then the, uh, the category which you attach to the circle is just home between these two pieces, and you can see quite elementary that, you know, this piece is C2, Cn, and this piece is Cn, and that's why I got, you know, it's some kind of, I can explain it after talk if you want. So, but all right. So Higgs, I want to see Higgs, right? Here the picture. So uh, what happens? You know, I kind of simplified picture. I told you like there is a cylinder, and there is like a, a defect which actually encodes your braid. But actually, if you zoom in into this defect, you would see a much finer picture. You have a hill band, hill band minus one, and so on, so on, so on, and that will encode your braid. And if you look at the how this, you know, uh, the walls intersect each other, you will see a projection of the braid, that's your braid. Okay. So, and, uh, and that's, you know, that's related to this quiz, you know, now you're going like from zero to N and back, that's this. Okay, let me explain. Um, all right, questions, should I go so far? So now I will explain how you get this picture, so, you know, how, you get Bray, you know, how you would see this, um, uh, this realization from the, uh, from this refined kapustin ozansky solomon series. So, and, and then the, the great thing that you don't have to do after you kind of uh, set up the theory correctly, you don't make any, you don't need to make any guesses somehow. It all kind of starts working. You just have to compute these metric realizations and everything works out. So it's, you'll, Okay, so let's uh, go back to this kapustin ozansky saulina theory, right? So I explained you kapustin ozansky theory in the case uh, when the target was holomorphic symplectic variety. But in general, it's really hard theory. So the, uh, the interesting uh, uh, case of holomorphic symplectic variety is just cotangents to the X, to the symplectic varieties. And you would expect theory to be a little bit easier in this case. And... Uh, Okay, so in this uh, case, uh, series simplifies, and that's exactly what's in the uh, uh, Kapustin Rosansky's papers. So they explain how to construct this KRS model in the case when it's cotangent to the variety of the X. Uh, in, uh, an advantage of this situation that uh, if you have a, a cotangent to the X, you can construct Lagrangians inside of X by using method of generating functions. So if you have a, you know, if you have an auxiliary space, so like this is a, uh, example that I want to say here. So I want to say that I want to construct a uh, Lagrangian inside uh, a cotangent to X or cotangent to Y. I claim that they have objects like this. I have a auxiliary space Z and the function on the product. Then I get a Lagrangian. So how do I get it? Well, I just say, you know, I just take, I say that we're looking at the critical points of W with respect to X and Y. And derivative of W with respect to Z variable is a potential, is a, is a, is an impulse. And you project it and that, that's literally generating function. So, and uh, that's what's going on. But uh, formally we say, well, now we have a category where the objects are this. So you're just looking at the uh, um, auxiliary space together with a function. And it's very easy to explain how you compose these things. Well, you have a, uh, the home from X to Y, which would be this Z prime, you know, the Z and W, and they have a 
on from y to w. Well, to compose it, you just take the bigger space, you can kind of take a product of uh, uh, these two guys times the, you know, this intermediate guy y, and you take this function. It's a very natural thing. And the home now, uh, between home between homes, you just say it's magic factorization. You know, that's, that's, that's where the magic factorization come back to you. So basically, before I told you some kind of crazy uh, derived, uh, uh, you know, coherent shifts on this crazy derived product, but now we just say that this is this. And uh, in many cases, you can just relate to the previous picture by using this Kazul duality. You know, the of, often this potential would be just a linear in some sets of variables, and you get back this, uh, you know, the coherence shift picture. Okay, so. All right, so this is what I told you. So that basically, if I, I know, I told you like at the beginning how to realize this kapustin rodowski series here when holomorphic symplectic varieties, but uh, here we have a much smaller category and you can embed one inside of another. You can say that, well, you have a manifold, you take a cotangent to X, you get a homomorphic symplectic one, and you have this Z, like auxiliary space Z with potential. Well, the vibration is, uh, this is the formula. I just wrote, I just wrote in, 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 in formals what I just said. So that's, that's how you construct a Lagrangian inside of the, uh, yeah, so that. That's, I, that's what I just said. Basically, if you take uh, the space F and project it on cotangent F, you get a Lagrangian. That's all that happens. What then? Right, right. So that's that's a great question because the uh, Hilbert scheme is actually quotient of some co some vector space. So that's why you have to actually uh, be a little bit more. Uh, careful, because you have to kind of develop a version with the uh, as an action. So you can actually define all of the same objects with a uh, you know gauge version of it. So it's technically it was not done on Kapustin Ozansky, Kapustin, but it's kind of it's a little bit ideas are the same. You just have to be a little bit more careful and spell out the details. So uh, and you know the our main example is like three category attached to GL. You know, the objects are integer numbers. So this is three category with objects integer numbers and the, the morphisms uh, you know between m and n are literally just you take a space z with Hamiltonian GLN GLM action so you have like left and right action on it. so these are the homes and now um, you know you can embed it back into our category by saying well we can always construct if you have objects like this we always can, can construct a potential the potential would be uh, the potential should be in on the space uh, GLN times GLN times Z, and here's the potential. You take a, you have two moment maps. You have a moment map with respect to GLN action, and you have a moment map with respect to GL. Okay, it's terrible. I should never say N and M because it sounds should be GLN and K. So because sounds M and N sounds the same. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so there are two moment maps, and you just pair them up with GLN and GLM, and you get a potential. So, and then. Uh, they're like a GL, the X is a GLN, and uh, uh, Y is a GL, uh, uh, GLM, and you have two moment maps. So, so this is quite manageable category, and it's actually a nice, interesting category. So, so the, and what we did in our paper, we actually have shown, we didn't show that something forms a three category because if you want to give a mathematical definition of three category, it's just impossible, it's just crazy. There's only two people in the world who understand what a three category is. So one of them probably wrote the definition and another one probably refereed. So uh, <laughs> I think it's true. <laughs> uh, basically there is a whole book which explains what are the three category, what three category is. And uh, you can explain what is three infinity category, but there is like 10 books which explain what is the infinity category. And we actually, what we did, but there are like nice explanation what is two category. And we have shown that somehow, if you kind of take some of the object and you look at this uh, um, and the morphism of this object, you get actually honest monoidal two category. And we checked all of the axioms of, uh, uh, there's a paper of uh, um, uh, Voivodsky and, uh, and Kapranov. 
where they introduce monoid multi-category, and we check that all of the axioms are satisfied. But I said that there's something rigorous now, or that was rigorous. Hey, all right, so anyway, so that's, we're actually interested in a much smaller uh, subset of this theory. We're interested in the um, object Z, which is, uh, if you say, you can say it's a home from GLN to GL0. There's only one, one GLN action. So, and, uh, uh, and, you know, then the two home, the homes between these two objects are, again, the metric organizations that I wrote for you before. All that I'm saying here that you can kind of reconstruct everything that I told you from these general principles. You don't have to do any guesses. So that's, as soon as you set it up, what I just showed you in the previous page, no guesses are needed. So, uh, and then you, there is one twist. We have to impose a stability condition, which is something that uh, not immediately obvious why you would do that, but we just do that. So basically, you're looking at this, uh, the same, it's the same space. You know, if you take quotient of the space by um, two copies of B of upturing, you get again cotangent to the flag twice times GLN. So, the, but now we impose this condition. You have this extra vector V, which is framing, and we impose condition that if you take moment map of one of the moment map and you take the second variable Y, then it's CN. And, you know, a, pre and a posteriori, you know, the stability condition is natural if you want to talk about Hilbert schemes. Hilbert schemes always have some stability condition. And what we have shown with left is this statement, that if you impose the stability condition, you get a morphism from the uh, braid carry, from the braids into this metric civilization. So and that doesn't follow from a Prisero Kavnik of Rich, because there is no causal duality for unstable. All right, so uh, should I? I don't know. So should I kind of take a break and ask uh, questions? May I think it's already said a lot. So maybe there are like a lot of details. Let me see. So let me see. That was another explanation from these two pictures. But let me just go back maybe to this. I think this is kind of a fun. I think this is kind of a fun slide. So basically, this I just advertised this category. This is like three category. Very very nice object. Like uh, objects are like integers and. Uh, the homes, this and the homes between homes are metric civilizations. Right, so. Any questions? Um, right, so that's uh, okay, that's how you see this. Um, um, that's kind of recap what I did before. So let me uh, explain it. Should I go into this? So, um um, yeah. Question. Yeah. Uh, so you previously had a picture that you have a minus one gram, yeah, region labeled by zero. Yeah. You have a three of the grams. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, you kind of shift the ground. So, yeah, yeah. well, there are some little problems with that because if you, you know, you wouldn't be, you would be able to do few things. You would be able to do like you're saying, like you put here, like one, yeah. two, three, four, five. Okay, that's good. Then you can draw circles like this, but you cannot do half circles. You no, know? you have no to draw like an interval. You need to go from zero to zero. This picture has some kind of advantage, but you can still do the same thing. So, you know, how to say, it. I didn't explain you what kind of defects are put here. There are some kind of explicit assignments, but in theory, you can actually do any picture you like. I put defects any way I like, put here any number I want, like a six, seven, eight, ten. You can do all of this stuff. And we explain it in our paper. And it turns out that this picture, you know, if I draw it like this, it still would be, it would not be braid invariant. It would be some kind of a contact not invariant. So, you know, you, know, you, don't, you, would, you would lose Markov move, but you would still have some kind of interesting invariant. But it would be a kind of a, it would be, to be, in, to be more precise, it would be invariant of transverse knot. You have some kind of contact structure on R2. You can lift it to the transverse knot. And this object, you know, where I put some kind of crazy numbers, whatever numbers I like, 
it would still would be some kind of invariant, but would be invariant of the transverse norm. That that was your question. All right. So, but somehow the fact that you know the fact that Hopf's invariant is invariant of a node is kind of a miracle. You know, it's a, because the Markov move is not obvious why it would be there. So and the, uh, and um, you know, more precisely, there is like positive and negative Markov move. It's, you can easily arrange that there is a positive Markov move, but when if you want to have both of them, that's a kind of special thing. So and if you kind of ready to sacrifice on the positive one, then you can have more, much more general picture. Yeah, yeah, you know, why do you put as Oh, you want to like you want to do S two cross S one. You want to do more general surface. Yeah, why, why S one? Yeah, you can do whatever you want. You know, this is like you know, this setup works for anything. So you can start start with any kind of say like. We can draw this like defects in um, any possible setting. So the question is, what kind of whether you get something interesting? So the, I would say there's this like local move, like the the braid move. Like that would be true locally. It's a local statement. But whether you get some kind of a global statement, that's another question. You know, for example, here we have this like a Markov move. So the Markov move means that I can kind of move through the central point. You know, I have, and my braid goes around the circle. Then if I have something like this, you know, the, you know, the, the special thing about the, this arrangement, when things go around like this, so suppose I have something like this, and I have a Markov move, right? So you know, then here I said it's like one, two, right? Then it turns out that it's equivalent to the case when you just have circle one, zero. And it only works if I have here the special defect. So if I don't have this, then it's not true. So this line defect, which I told you, like which goes through the middle, it's essential for the Markov move. If you don't have this, then it's not true. Does it answer your question? So it's important. So this is a special property. I don't know. Maybe that's um, that was just rigorous construction of this. Uh, um, of uh, um, that's another kind of definition of this uh, flag field. This you know of this object. So well, okay. So let me do this again. Pictures are much better than the formula. Okay. That's this picture again. Okay. That's our space. We would do like our sigma model and defect in this case is beta times s one. And you know we assign numbers in a monotonous way. It's like zero, one, two. That's just repeating the same picture again, but with more details. So now we zoomed in. So now uh, we have uh, kind of uh, you know we have these uh, defects which possibly intersect, and we also need to assign some kind of uh, signs to the intersection points according. Uh, you know basically you have to say whether it's undercrossing or overcrossing because defects themselves do not know whether it's positive or negative crossing. And you know that would be uh, if you if you like you can talk about this like Sorry, yeah, yeah sure so where is S one it's going in this direction it's going this direction S one going this this is the this is the slice of the picture and S one going this direction why, is there why, why there's is there an S one you're asking why there is S one why there is why this one. Why there's because when we have three dimensional theory, 3D theory. I know, but I thought, I thought your 3D theory is basically this. You can reduce it. I see you, you're talking about, I see, I see what you're saying. So you want to get. I think you kind of, uh, you know, you we're talking about different S ones. I think you're talking about this picture, which I'm talking about. This topological thing it sits inside a Calabiao. Then there is a Taub knot. You're probably talking about S one and Taub knot. So this. No, I would have. Uh, so, so um, I would have wanted to have something that is like this, but then I Maybe, maybe, maybe. So that's uh, maybe it's not no S one. You, you, 
your I will not argue well, with you. It doesn't play any role. You can yeah, replace this one by R. Okay, yeah, we can cut it off. That, yeah. that, that indeed doesn't, doesn't uh, matter. Okay, so that's the picture of the defect. No, no, Mina is right. You can replace this one by R. That's okay. We don't use, uh, we don't use any rotation along, the, along this one. I mean, you will reduce on the circle from the side from M0 to the decimal point, but, but, but that, 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 that circle, but circle is here, so it's, it's not going, circle is, circle is not going this direction. So your question is like, you want to get Hilbert scheme of points on C2, but it's a, it would be circle sitting on two dimensional slice. So mean is absolutely right. You can replace this one by R, and it's probably better because it's less confusing. So we never use yeah, this as one. Thanks. That's a good point. Uh, all right. So then, uh, what I'm trying to say here? Oh, yeah, that's actually I'm I'm giving details on uh, how would you see this? Um, uh, do I explain it? Um, should I? You know, maybe I will skip it and go to the supergroups. So people were interested in oh. supergroups, or uh, should I do this? Description. So that's again the same picture. No, so. I didn't want to, uh, no. Okay, okay, okay. So I can explain this. So okay, so this is the uh, that's the uh, again the same picture, but now I can again cut it in two ways. Let me just draw it here. So you can cut it this way or this way, All right? So if I cut it this way, I got on this line. Uh, basically, uh, you know, my line uh, itself has a uh, you know, this intersection with defects, and on the line you would have like a you would have exactly this quiver which goes from Two to one to zero and the one to zero. That's how you see this uh, flag variety, the, this the Stenberg. So, but you know, it could be explained. You know, I wrote the formulas for you so that basically what happens that um, the um, this is like notation for the interval for the interval which goes from zero to n, but kind of uh, goes from like zero to one to two and so up to one to n. And actually, what we do in our paper, we explain what is what kind of elementary defect you attach for the uh, interval which goes from n to k for any m to k. Then you just compose them, and composition of this uh, uh, defects it's uh, it actually involves some JT quotient. So it's like you know uh, how you can start, you can think about this like Hilbert's, you know, you can think about this quiver as kind of you know made of these little quivers, right? So you take this, this. This, this, and you just compose them together, and here you just take a, I don't know, GLN code, not GL. In this case, I guess, uh, I guess I should, I should explain like this GLN, GL three portions. And that's what literally appears in this story. So basically, you kind of, you want to cut this uh, uh, quiver into pieces and kind of glue them back together. Um, um, did I, did, I didn't write that on the slide because I think it's too technical. People usually complain. I, I kind of, so maybe, may, okay, maybe I'll mention it. So suppose you have like interval. Okay, actually I wrote it, sorry. So like uh, you have a, uh, okay, good. So first I need to tell you what are the, uh, what kind of object I attach to the invisible wall. So basically the, the wall which goes for the point marked by n and to n. So I'll explain uh, how I evaluate um, partition functions on uh, some particular simple disks with, defa with defects. Uh, but, sorry, are you trying to explain to us how to get Homsley, or are you explaining to us how to get a... I'll explain you how to get this. Uh -huh. So how to get it from some kind of elementary pieces. So uh, the first piece of this uh, data, uh, you know, to construct my 3D uh, topological fields here, I need to explain what kind of uh, objects I attach to the walls, to defects. First, I explain what I attach to this like empty wall, basically, which goes from the, uh, you know, from N to N. It just contains into the group. So that's the right object. So now suppose I go from N to M, where N and M are not equal. So I need to attach some kind of morphism from GLN to GLM, 
Well, and it turns out that the object you want to attach is just a coten is just vector space. It's like a, a cotangent to the space of n times m matrices. And now I need to give you a potential. I didn't write your potential, okay? But it's there is only uh, well, I did write your potential because uh, you know this space has action of GLN and GLM. There are two moment maps, and that gives you a potential. So that's that's the object you attach. So Basically, uh, uh, the moral of these things, you know, you want to attach to the world the most elementary objects you could possibly think of. So, you know, but what is the natural space which has action of GLN and GLM? Well, n by n matrices. Are you explaining how to get spaces? Yeah, I'm explaining how to get spaces of these things. Now, what I'm saying that if you compose, you know, this, you know, now I want to compose this elementary pieces. To obtain something more interesting, so you know, I told you that if I take uh, this object from M to K and like N to N, if I compose them, I take product of the spaces Z and I take a quotient with respect to the GLM, to the middle one, and that's JT quotient. And uh, if you do the computation, if you do the composition, like first you take a defect from zero to one, from one to two, up to N. If you compose them all together, you discover that the object you get at the end, because of these quotients, is it literally contains to the flag variety. So you know that's. I'm saying that you don't need to do any guessing. And uh, uh, what Peng was saying, like in principle, you can put here like any sequence of numbers. You get some other query variety, some other thing. You can work with that too. So it's very flexible. This construction is very flexible. Okay, so and then you know, then you just go down, uh, you know, the rabbit hole and just do all of the things which you're supposed to do. You now, now I want to study like self home of this thing, which is exactly this. You know, take the two copies of flag variety or the moment map, and this is your category of metastasization. Why did they? Oh, okay, so this is the simplest case. And if you want to study self home of a, of a, of the identity object, which is like you know, this is the home from n to n, then you get this guy, which is, if you remember, there was some kind of potential appearing like before. It's actually, this object is uh, by some kind of causal duality is equivalent to the Hilbert scheme. Which is not, maybe not obvious, but that's, uh, um, right. So that this two, these two lines are related. Maybe I'll, if there are questions, I can explain it later. But, the, the point of this uh, slide was to explain um, how you get the flag varieties and everything from elementary pieces. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I suppose I have like, you know, the, uh, the fact the wall which separates N and M. I need to tell you, uh, I need to kind of define your like Lagrangian attached to this. I mean, you know, as Vina said, you have like R, but which you can ignore. So it's all, it's all times R. All right, so I need to tell you what kind of Lagrangian I attach here together with vibration. And I told you that, you know, attaching Lagrangian is, you know, in the case, in this year, in case it's, you know, you can attach Lagrangian by just giving me a space with action of GLN and GLM. And you know, this moment maps give you potential and everything. Yeah, yeah. When I'm telling you that the space which you need to take here is just cotangent to the uh, n by m matrices. That, that's my choice. Okay. Uh, then you have to choose, you know, then you kind of, uh, you know. What is the thing that's uh, invisible? Yeah, the invisible, the invisible thing is when m is not equal to m. But if I have some invisible walls, you know, like this. Then I attach to this cotangent to the uh, GLN. So this is N. Yeah, so that you're just being GL, but not the cost. Well, in particular, you need to explain that, you know, if you compose this thing with this, you should get thing the same. You need to explain why this is a unit. It's some computation. It's not, you know, I cannot choose these things around randomly. It should be a unit. And that's the only right choice for the unit. Two home is uh, you know it's two home is basically it's a Lagrangian so you know, two home is Lagrangian together with vibration because if I have a, if I have an object if I have object like you know 
something like this. It has the moment map. You know, the, uh, it, it gives you the moment map, gives you the map from this space to GLN. That's the vibration. Mm -hmm. Two home, it's a home between homes. This is the home. It's a home from uh, N to N to itself. And uh, I can have homes between homes. That's, <laughs> this is like, it's getting too much of the category stuff. It's not that I'm a big fan of it, but uh, if you have like a two categories, then you have, a, a, you have a home between objects. And if you have two on like, if you fix two objects and you have two different homes between the same pair of objects, then you have home between these homes and kind of a, and the categorical level goes down as you keep going. Yeah, it's kind of difficult to draw. All right. Okay. Sorry. So there's a lot of technical details. That, that's how you see, you know, the, if that was the cut this way. And, uh, you know, if you cut it this way, so if you cut it this way, so you got this category. If I cut it other way, I will get this this other category. So I'm sure this is the if you cut it this way, then you get this other because it's now we have a home from two to itself. So it's kind of invisible wall situation. All right, then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. This one. Yeah. Right. 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 So this is like that. You know, this object would know about braid. This object would know only about this line defect, and would not know braid. It's kind of identity braid, if you like, but times the. Um... And you can probably spell this out formally with all these objects put together, where they have the pulse, but the pulse can't right? Which is fine. That's possible. Is that possible? Or in one of these frameworks, we can have to compute. No, we can compute, you know, how to say it. We can we check that how which framework you put you work. Yeah, yeah. So to kind of to make sense of all of this cutting, you just have to check the axioms of monoidal two category. If you have a monoidal two category, then all of this, like you know, the statements that you can cut this way or other way follow. Mm -hmm. And we do check it. So you know it actually also have to show that there are two Right, right. We do have to show that. It's, it's, Yeah, so the heap empty set, that means, you know, you have no braid here. And then you have the, uh, you know, that's the, the D heap at the disk with uh, no braid inside it. And then you have the complement of the disk, which is also a disk. Uh, and, uh, and S2, sorry, like it should be S2. It's an S2. So then, um, yeah, and then it, it knows about braid. So in this, uh, the object attached to the complement of this thing, that would be interesting object in Hilbert scheme. That's what. Uh, that was this like first slide is all about. So the DQ uh, yeah, it comes to response to interior. So maybe I should put like you know not empty set but the line defect. Right, line defect. Can you go previous slide? Yeah. Other key use? Just... Yeah, this is Steinberg. I mean by Steinberg. You remember I told you that the this thing is related to the flag right or Steinberg. So that's the Steinberg picture. You have a uh, two, you know, now you have a two disks, you know, one disk and another disk. On this side, you see identity braid, right? On this thing, you have interesting braid. And that's how you see homes between, you know, some of that. So that one category is the uh, home. No, this one category is the home between homes. It's a, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, the one category is the uh, self home. You can say that. You know, you can cut this uh, red line into two pieces, you know, this, this piece and this piece. And this, the whole category is a home between this piece and this piece. And yeah, that's how you can. So because, you know, this piece would be home between zero and two. And this piece would be home between uh, actually zero and two going this direction. And you can do home between homes and then you get one category. Sorry, it's like, you know, we have to get used to that language. It's kind of a little bit, I, it took me a while to kind of get used to that myself. So, 
Please ask questions if you have. Okay, so that's all right. So that uh, I explain again, you know, again, I explain how I get Hilbert scheme. So Hilbert scheme uh, appears. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So only one of the classes being excluded would be actually. That's right. Yeah. Only one of them would. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. All right. So this is like again repeating what I said before. So, you know, you could uh, sort of do this uh, disks filled with the brain. You know, the, in the standard picture, you get this object. And uh, and this object is constructed by this, you know, this recovering a fresh type construction. And uh, uh, for the Hilbert schemes, I know on, on this another construction where you take a, uh, you know, this complement. Or how to say it, this line is related to this picture, this card. That's this card. So then the next line would be related. Now this line is related to this one. So now we have an object attached to the. Uh, the complement to this, like disk in the center, that would be Hilbert. And I say that you know the empty. Yeah, I should use the. I should have written disk. Yes. So. The, the, this one. Hill, but means that this kind of uh, appears in the Hill picture. So and maybe this uh, the superscripts are the kind of misleading. So just ignore the superscripts. I mean, you know, the Hill appears here because this in eventually this object belongs to the Hilbert scheme. And this one belongs here in like Steinberg because get an object, this uh the recovering of reach type object. So that's that's all. So you know the in the uh in the heart, you know, this is just repeating the picture. So, you know, just just think again about this picture. You can cut this picture two ways. And in one way, this way, you see the Steinberg variety and this interesting braid construction. And then another, this way, you see the Hilbert scheme. But because of the topological field theory, you can glue this plane from two pieces two ways, but you get the same answer. That's why, you know, you can either think about Steinberg or you can think about Hilbert scheme. Questions? That's all right. So that's just a recap of what I have kind of said. So you know, this is coming back. So you know, on this side, that was the you know the the fact that you can go from the braid into the Hilbert scheme. You can just formalize, like write it in more uh, you know, uh, in more representation theory friendly terms. But I'll just move on. And that's our theorem. So basically. It doesn't matter. So, you know, I kind of explain it generally, like a presentation theoretically. So, okay. So, let, let's let's get to this. This is kind of that's probably. Yeah. Right. Just in terms of the linear matter. Okay. So, um, in terms of the linear matter, you actually may have been on the paper. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, it's so undeveloped. I remember. Okay. So, Vivek <laughs> had this, um, what Thomas has, he had this. Way of describing homophilies where, uh, where, where for braid, you, the, the knot here, you have to draw the right knot to associate some intersection of an algebraic curve. Mm -hmm. And then three, and then you would, you would, you would, um, right, 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 right. Picture, right. The, the, you don't do this here anyway. No, I don't, because that picture is a, that was a paper with Vivek actually a long time ago. So that, you, right? but it's, uh, um, yeah, that, but. There is a physics explanation for this, right. so it's nice. but this picture only works for the not for the uh, for the special types of braids. Because if I have a like algebraic curve, uh -huh. and I take a link of algebraic curve, then it's only special knots that appear. You know, for those who uh -huh. like these words, they all would be like knots of the volume zero. If you want to know this volume conjecture, they you know for the topology they are the ones which are the least interesting. Uh -huh. so, and uh, this construction, which I explained for you, it's uh -huh. true for any knot. So, um, and you know, in, the, in this story with like, you know, with algebraic nodes, it's prettier picture because in that story, you can also do this uh, grove witten DT correspondence because, you know, your braid comes from some kind of uh, 
algebra geometric object, and he can actually attach some shift theory to the curve. And, uh, and, and, and the, the, the relation to original orthogonality drawn of this, is, is it manifest in any of these pictures? I, I should not. Yeah, I am. No, it's still a conjecture, you know, like you know, on the level of homology, you know, this conjecture which we had with, with you know, with Divac is still not proven. And the relation of your stuff, that, that your thing is exactly the same as the Corona and stuff the original did, is that manifest or not? No, it's not. It's, there, there, there is some kind of there is some kind of discussion which we kind of uh, having right now. Like maybe there is some physical explanation for this conjecture, but it's. It's kind of a little bit vague. No, I mean your thing. The, this this VVAC stuff is VVAC. It probably does fit into this picture somehow. Well, the VVAC stuff is very typical, yeah. Right, uh, and um, yeah, this is like a that's more general stories. So it's for general braids. So. But you should probably be able to derive that stuff from it. Probably yes, yeah. It's probably. No, 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 no. It, it's just it's probably would be part. It's an interesting problem to kind of see how it fits into that. It should. Mm -hmm. So just one other question. question. So the Q can P two somehow I think it pushes to uh, S one. Yeah, seven. yeah, yeah. This is S one. And so I, I, this is. It is like another type of circle. There is like circle. You know, as I told you, like you know, I just go back. Is that the line? Here? Yeah. So this is also circle. You know, it's a, it's S two. So it's a zero marked by the segment zero one to an absolute end. Right. That's this uh, MF stable that's associated to this kind of thing. And the Hilbert scheme is attached to this, to this right, right. circle. Why, there are Why there is functor between them? Um, it's some kind of, it's basically a chain functor. So in some sense. Um, I can imagine you can, I don't, I don't so let's make, it, it's easy to explain. So, you know, this thing, because you can think about it as a, a Home, I know this thing, as I told you, you know, this the category attached to the circle, it's a home from n to z from two to zero. Right? And uh, uh, in general, there is some kind of a churn functor which would go, you know, zero is nothing. So right, so it's kind of you could say it's a home from uh, two to two. And uh, the churn functor would tell you that uh, you would uh, you would if you have like an object, how to say it? You have an object of two category together with an endomorphism. So the beta is an endomorphism of this object. Then the churn functor would send uh, the object together with the endomorphism into the center of this category. It's just like, you know, in the one level down. So suppose I look at the um, coherent shifts, right? So I look at the coherent shifts on, a, um, on some variety X. What is the, uh, what are the, uh, what is coherent shift? You can think about it as a, uh, some kind of endomorphism of X on itself. You take a diagonal inside of X and you put this shift on the diagonal and it's endomorphism. It gives you kind of math from coherent shifts on X to itself. If you like, it's just tender product with multiplication F. And the usual riemann roch tells you that if you want to compute uh, the, uh, the global sections of the shift, you can um, do it two ways. You can um, just compute it by definition or you can apply riemann roch You take a churn character of your shift and you basically integrate it along the X. And that, that's the riemann roch or like whatever the definition. And you know, when you take a churn functor, you kind of go to this, you go from the... It gives you all the characteristics, yes. So it gives you all the characteristics of this. You know, it's a kind of early characteristic. It's an analog of the early characteristics in some sense. You know, the, and the you know the Riemann you know, the usual Riemann Roch tells you that the, and the how to say it uh, the churn functor takes value in the uh, differential forms on your x which is like a center it's a vector space it's, a, it's a, if you like it's a center of the monoidal category of coherent shifts on your uh, right so and that's and this statement works more general if you have like you know uh, if I have a monoidal two category to any uh, object together with endomorphism, I should be able to attach the like, object in the uh, in the, the center of the category. So you know, we start with an object of two categories with endomorphism, with an endomorphism, and we get at the end uh, object of one category. That's like you know one categorical level up, and that's literally what's going on here. So you know, here 
you know, as I said, you have the object from a uh, home from two to zero, and the beta, you know, this braid is uh, actually a morphism, and the morphism of this object. And the center of this category is this uh, Hilbert scheme. That's another thing you can show. We, we show that. And that's, you know, this construction, this functor which I showed for you, it's literally a Riemann row. So this one, going from this uh, Hilbert scheme, from the uh, metric realization to the uh, Hilbert scheme. You know, and, yeah, well, I mean, my, this is a fancier version of it. Yeah. Yeah, so you can look at the uh, category, this, the, this category. This is the category uh, which, with monoidal structure. So, and then there is a notion of a center. Right? So it's basically, what is the center? It's, a, um, it's again one category, which is, uh, uh, if you like, it's a, objects are uh, central objects. So basically they're all of the objects together such that they commute with uh, any given object together with explicit and the more you know, realization of this uh, commutation relation. And that's the kind of, uh, that's what called Greenfield center. That's the Greenfield center of the category. And you can show that Greenfield center of this category is exactly this. And that's why you have this, you know, the two categorical chain functor, which going from the, you know, object uh, you know, here together with the morphism into this. I don't know, it's, a, it's just some kind of, how to say that, these are just kind of general framework, but then we just prove mathematical theorems. We just construct these functors by hand. And so on the computer side, is there any name to this one or somewhere I go through? You mean like one categorical level down? You know, like the center, what are the center of the? No, 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 but in, uh, only if you go from the first level down. Right. Right, if you take a K group, then it's literally, you know, then it's much easier to say that you have a, K, you know, there's a K series of this thing, which is uh, literally would be algebra. And this is also algebra, you know, and this is commutative algebra because you can, you know, it's a tender product. And you can show that the, uh, you know, this churn functor, if you have to apply K series, you will be literally, you take like, you know, uh, this Heike algebra element, you know, that would be the, the K series of this is just Heike algebra. You just send it to, you know, you just apply the character functor. So, you know, that's, you know, that's literally categorifies, you know, that's the picture which I was drawing for you. So here, um, this, the K series of this, I didn't write, it should be K series. K series of this is literally the Heike thing. And then there is a map from the Heike uh, algebra into its center. So which is, you apply all possible characters of the finite dimension representation. Then there's a core character map. You can include center inside of the Heike algebra. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we can basically categorify this story. So basically this, this is a kind of a categorification of this, and this is categorification of this, and there are like analogous maps back and forth. And they have all of the natural properties you would expect. You know, this is, this is like a trace map, this direction. That's why the trace property, and this map is monoidal. You include center inside of it, and that's why we have this property. And, and the, object would, the object that you get from here would be central and a bunch of other properties. All right, let's go to the right. Okay. <laughs> All right, so here. Here. So that's what, I, that's what I was trying to kind of get into. So basically, we have the braid, and in the middle, I can put all kinds of things. You know, I told you that in the middle, so far, we had just like a line defect. But the point is that you can actually do other things. You can, for example, put here, uh, this, uh, you know, NSN defect. Sorry, the picture uh, represents uh, the two brain and even an S, right? Right, it's only like, you know, it's a two dimensional slice of the picture. There are also like other directions yeah. which go like in Taub knot, which I'm not and talking about. Yes, now I replace the stuff and I can say that I can vary the stuff. I can choose what I want to put here. So what I was talking so far was this, you know, this column. So if I put in the middle, like in the, the line defect, uh, with this marking, with this uh, special vector, uh, like vector bundle, then I get triple graded homology. So then I talked about the Zergel story. So which is like, you know, you're putting like NS, NS5 brain, which is uh, of charge N, which is literally the defect between N and zero. You know, that's if I want to draw, maybe I should draw a picture like five, then it's zero. That's exactly NS5 
five is charge five. So then I get zero goodbye modules. I mean, ignore this braid, like flat stuff, you know, I can explain it later. But so then you get this uh, algebraic, you know, the zero goodbye module that happens. Right? <laughs> what? Legal, legal R. This one? This one? Oh, R, yes, that's, that's framing. I'll explain it in a second. So, so the, hmm? Mm -hmm. with, uh, with a pair of boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. So there, there are one so, and, boundary and, conditions kind of silly. I think it's, there's nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. So, but, so, the, so one of these boundary conditions is just like black and a boundary condition. Right. And the other one you say, if you give the other boundary condition to be like this, n to zero. Right. Then, then, you, then uh, you get this. Uh, then then the, the, the space around it is just yeah, Hogshaw model. They equal somehow for some unexplainable reason. Okay. Uh, now, you know, these two cases are probably also interesting. So uh, I can also put here um, different types of the uh, line defect. So, which is the same vector bundle, but together with differential. Then uh, you get also isotopy invariant, which categorifies the super invariant, which I will explain in a second. Then there is a fourth option. So, you know, you can also put. Yeah. Are, are you saying that you can um, actually understand this, this so in particular to take k equal to zero, you can understand the differentials that look on, um, Yes. So you actually can now define yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh? yeah, that's that's the same you know, paper book of uh, Rasmussen and uh, yeah. yes, that's that's the same differential. Dunford, yes. All right, so um so then there is this column which is kind of interesting on its own right. So uh, then you know I can start doing something more interesting inside of this red region. I can start putting like D5 brains. So now that again, you know, this, uh, we only see like two dimensional pieces of this. There are some kind of uh, extra dimensions, which I, I don't want to discuss for now. So then what you get, for example, if I put two D5 brains of charge K and N minus K, so then again, I go down to zero. I go like to from N to like a, a, to uh, n minus k and to zero. Then it turns out what I get here as a partition function is a trace of the action of the braid on some kind of on conformal blocks. Or oh, you can I can I will define it like representation theoretically. It's some kind of weight space, and that's closely you know that's closely related to SL two homology, for example. So you know the SL two homology you can define it as a kind of in SL two invariant you can define it as a um, you can look at the R matrix. Why do you have, what is the case? Is that the same name? Oh, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Yeah, the, yeah, the so K is this, the same as this one. All right. So when, when N is equal to K, and uh, then that will be related to SL2 homology. So you, you will see it in a second. I, will. So you, I don't think I believe that. So you want to say that um, from partition function, the two dimensional, of the three dimensional theory on, on S1. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's it actually, uh, it's not stated here, but you can actually get uh, annual of one of homology from, on this, from this thing. Okay, so let's start with super group. Okay, so, um, yeah, I was explaining to you that, you know, I will work with this Hilbert scheme of points on C2. Uh, actually, can you just go back? So, yeah. So, um, from, from the system of brains, because this is like, yeah, from the system of brains, great. Um, you want to say, you want to study, uh, you want to study the three dimensional theory? Uh, it's kind of mixture because that's a kind of, a, uh, yeah, so I want to do Higgs. Yeah, this is all Higgs. Yeah, it's all Higgs. And, but, you know, because, uh, but because I'm mixing N S5 and D5, I only get two types of the bow. You know, this would be that would give you bow variety. You know, N S, you know, N S5 brains over here, they give you braid. You know, braid, I know it always comes from the stack of NS5s. I don't do anything here. So but I can change stuff in the middle. That's my choice, you know, that 
And you know, it turns out that if you make some intelligent choices, you can get more invariance, more interesting invariance. This one? Oh no, it's uh, that, that's not oh, it just. Want to, you want to say it's a home state between the two. It's a home between the, yeah, yes. So you're saying that this is a way of simplifying your basic analysis. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. Yes, that's, uh, that's, I think that would be a way to unify but, um, It should be like V no, model of this. Actually, no, 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 no. I think you're working on the, on the, on the Coulomb the branch. Way. Mm -hmm. And there, there are, even in, in for, for the Doge one, the explanation mm -hmm. of how this actually works out, if you get a link invariant, is extremely mysterious. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, if you, if you think you understand it, it's all right, we're going to be help. Because if one can understand it, mm -hmm. then one gets uh, that they're, they're better, that they're, they're real application of life. So if one gets a deep pattern invariant, it's mm -hmm. that world. No. But it's very hard thing to, to get a handle on. Hmm. Interesting. So Okay, well, I'll explain what I understand. So then we can see how far we can get with that. Well, let's start with the super stuff. All right, so um, I told you that on Hilbert Schema Points in C2, they have this tautological bundle, rank n bundle. And the fibers of this bundle are, I don't know, if you remember, uh, the fibers of B, and it was just like a quotient of a, uh, so the, I have a picture. Here. Here. So um, this is the picture. That's but, uh, but you don't have. In other words, right. you can also recover invariance of real space. Right. In our case. However, I think in your, in your world, you might, you, you might get something which, which only corresponds to the right? Rate that, in other words, yes. Like that's right. But there is more. There is more. There is more. There is more. Let's hear the picture. So let's see the picture. Let me draw it. So that's, that's the essence of what's going on. So if you study like braids, and I jump to very end, but you know, let me just draw this picture. So, so you can study braids which are singular, so which have singularity. But if you put the right object, you know, if you, oops, did I, what, what, did I run out of? Maybe I'm out of, uh, I do have a, my charger. So it's strange because I charged it this morning. Is there a charge and other? Sorry for that. It's not another thing. I have a long, this is kind of reasonably long cord. Hmm. Strange, because I charged it this morning. Give it two seconds. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll write something on the blackboard for this. Well, let's, let's give it like one minute before it kind of arrives. Right, so uh, for the super case, um, it's easy to explain. So I think it's, it's fine, it's charging. So I think it's kind of run out of charge for some strange reason. Ah. Yeah, I'm around of, out of sight. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, it's kind of loading up. So, but as I told you, now, there's this uh, this uh, vector bundle on Hilbert scheme of points. Uh, the fiber of bundle over the ideal i is a quotient. Like this. So, in particular, if I, I can choose, you know, if I choose uh, M and K, that would be a section here. That's an element here. Right. So, because of that, so did I? Is it loading?
Is is it the get too hot, got too hot, or something? I think the last time I had to kind of um, okay, I think. Does it see? Okay, it's connecting. Sorry for that. So, but I think it's good break for everybody. I think. So the one thing which you know I did not say I don't know how to do the break you know how to do the supergroup case of the of this you know if you look back to this so. I did not claim that I can do any supergroup on this side. That would be super interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I can. I get it. Uh, it just you know it's an annular Havana homology. No, 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 no. Oh, this one. Geometrically, what is it? Uh, geometrically, it's basically um, it's a home between two uh, shifts on the on uh, um, on resolution on on Slodovy slice. It will be some Slodovy slice to some kind of important uh, orbit. It's kind of already developed. You know, this is like theory of uh, Anno and other people. So you know, Anno developed theory and it fits into that. And in some sense, it, we can explain how to generalize it a little bit more. So I'll, I'll already know. I have a slide to this. I can explain. Should I jump to this or explain the super case? It doesn't matter for me. Um, I can go to the last column, right? Yeah, I would love. I think this is kind of, you probably you've seen this thing already. So, um, I did. All right. So here it is. So um. um Right, so there's this uh, story about the ball varieties, which I kind of think slightly differently. You know, this is the ball variety for me. Well, this is the ball variety for me, and I choose, you know, a sequence of L's. And let's say, you know, this side is just usual flag variety. Where's my? That's the usual flag variety. So, so I can fuse flag variety with this. And what have what have been shown by uh, Nakajima and Taniyama is that. Um, uh, the quotient of this quiver by the natural uh, group, which kind of scales, you know, this gauges this row, uh, is the resolution of the slow doorway slice um, to the newpotent orbit. Is it newpotent orbit uh, with no, Jordan? Actually, the the yeah, that's right. right. That's a, that is right. So. Um, and that, that's the picture, you know, we have a D5 brains, you know, this is different. And lambda is a different difference of LIs. And that's the picture when you have the defects, you know, D5, 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 then NS5, NS5, and you know, charge one. So this, this side is like all the picture. Okay. All right. So now, you know, let me give the correct statement. You know, that's the, that's the space which people usually study. You just start with like Verma module for like SL2. And uh, um, this space is just the space. Yeah, I just want to do SL2. You know, you can do SLN in general. I just want to do simple example. Just, you know, that, and uh, you know, they're just looking at the space of maps from the Verma module uh, with this weight. And we assume that mu here is generic, so that no kind of funny, funny business happening. And I take uh, n copies of the uh, two dimensional presentation, take this product, and uh, extract this product. Okay, that's some kind of weight space. And you know, there is an actual action on this space of the braid. So, and let's define, you know, denote by the trace with the sub indices, just the trace of action of this 
braid on this face. Like so. And uh, um, and in, uh, how it's connected to what I just said. So basically, if I um, um, so, right. You will, you will see it in a second. Maybe, maybe, maybe. maybe you don't want to get away from that. You want to really, you want to stop with the head of the brain. No, no, no. There, there would be, there would be, uh, there would be, impo it's important thing that we get actually tangles. It's not just braids. Sure. Yeah. So, but you can, you force it to go around. That's true. But you can, okay, I'll, I'll draw a picture. Let me draw a picture. So maybe you've seen it before. So, um, suppose I want to kind of uh, construct, this is my tangle. Okay, and I want to compute the uh, the Havana of homology of this thing. What I'm gonna do it? I kind of embed it inside of the annular, and I attach to this some kind of uh, extra. So this is like you know this is my series which goes to like uh, zero two, like zero one two. Okay, so now this is a kind of a singular braid. So that's a it's kind of a it's a well-defined object, so now it's annular but singular braid. So you know it's not. So, it's, so you actually do want to think of the pattern as being real. So you're not. Yes. Saying, uh, it exists. You know, I kind of put it there. Now and, and I construct. You know, and I uh, evaluate my partition function. And here there's like an S5 braid, and S5 plus an S5. So okay. So now I claim that this would be exactly SL2 invariant of this why, thing. Why why do I need this? Yeah. Because as I said, I always have to work with closure of the braid. You're right, so I need the closure of the braid, but I can work with a singular braid, with this kind of this funny braid. And uh, the thing I need to show that while well, uh, I could have done some kind of uh, read master move, or, you know, could have realized it, if it would be more complicated picture, I could have had like, I don't know, some kind of a different thing. I could have attached this like, you know, I've done something funny here if I have two of this, right? So. Mm -hmm. And I have to show you that it doesn't really matter what I do here. So, and yeah, that's a computation, but it could be done. Okay, so, so what's the charge on that uh, on that go back to that two or one? Yeah, but you know, the charge is the same. So like you want to do with, let's just erase right, what. The, 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 the what does it have in the singular? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the singular? yeah it's, it's a thickness two, it's thickness okay. two. It's, a, it's NS5 of charge two. So here it was NS5 of charge one, NS5 charge one. And we have no, you know, I explained you how to construct NS5 of any thickness. So that was the slide before. And, you know, you just do this. And, you know, then you just show that it's actually, even though I did something funny, I kind of picked some kind of way to suspend my knot on these things. It actually, the answer does not depend on this. So, because you know you can, you might as well erase it. I I will write the you know algebraic statement in one of the slides. Is the, the, the strand oriented or is that? Uh, it's oriented, yeah. So it's oriented. But then the statement again, it is a linear invariant is what? Uh, the multiple guy is what? Is that? It's what? Sorry. Uh, it, it geometrically, it's it, you're saying you're. Uh, it's going up, so you know this is the that's, that's, if that's what you're kind of you can always pick it up like this. So it's because it's you, you kind of have to make some choices. Wow, well, you kind of choose this. Uh, so you play the same game as you did before by sort of cutting things up in different ways and maybe just do this circle and palm right. between something in the middle. Yeah, yeah. You just do the same game as before. I kind of I didn't you know I can even explain you what that touch is this, you know, this this story which I told you, you know. It's actually very general. I can draw any kind of configurations. Like this, the singular thing, it's also with a financial object attached to this. We, yes, it's completely computable. And, uh, right. So, and, right. And basically, you know, what I wrote here that that's this, you got the right object if you kind of put this on this. I don't know how to do supergroups because uh, here I had a kind of you had, the, you had the, this clue. I mean, if you're not interested in computing it, then definitely. 
no, I'm, I'm super interested in super groups you know, <laughs> to make it to make it funny, but, <laughs> but um, okay. So you know the conjecture is that you know the conjecture because we didn't you know we're still writing details, but so far things work out. So and you know the the statement which I wrote for you that's you know that's the algebraic statement. So you have this uh, single braid which is uh, exactly as Peng was saying. So here you have a edge of a thickness two. So and you can kind of consider like bigger monoid, which include the braids, meaning this overcrossing and undercrossing and the single crossings, which is, I don't know, like it's this, if you only have like, you know, this crossing that's called like flax, broad, blade, uh, braid graphs, but you can actually have both, like, you know, the overcrossing and, uh, and, and actually, you know, we only even know the answer for this. No, I'm so sorry, I have. Yeah. But that you're saying that you you don't. Well, maybe you're having smooth, jointly smooth, smoothly jointly. Except that then you have to explain why don't they just what prevents them from? Uh, yeah, that's very dangerous stuff. What prevents them from separating? I mean, if I if I were to think of these guys as two and five and smoothly joined to a third one, mm -hmm. spread them apart, and then you, you don't have a picture of pattern. Mm. Can you compute oil characteristics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oil it all works out. So I look at this. Okay. So how will you how will you get them to how will you get that junction then? This one? Yeah. That's you know, if for example it's like one, one, two is just cotangent to the two-dimensional flag. So it's you know it's the same you know, you can you can cut it open. So you know, when you you know this is circle, it has a here's you know, let me put markings here. So two, one. Two, uh, I'm sorry, so I did, I messed it up. So it's a two, one, zero, right? Maybe what you do, but at least you put a, you put a fiber in there, so that's the end of the fiber. And maybe, maybe somehow it operates to survive. Even though I know you put two and fiber in because you want to say it in Kona, that's really somewhat trivial about it. Well, you know, all that I'm saying is here that here I have this picture, right? So it's, a, you know, I just look at the circle and it behaves like this. I got two, one, and one here, right? That's that's the, uh, you know, that's the circle around here. Hey, what are you doing? Well, I just I gave you I wrote you on slide. Here you have a, you know, home. I know the two by cotangent to C two. This is cotangent to C, and. Uh, Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's exactly what's going on. I think it's quite dangerous to me. It seems strict that you're getting things. So I just want, I would like to worry. You can get things that I don't think strict is perfect. Well, you know, you need to check something. It's not that it's kind of uh, for, for free. Okay. So you know, basically, now you know that gives you the category. Now you have to attach some kind of. There is some. Um, now, now you need to make a choice. You know, what kind of object you attach here, and there is a natural object that attached here. Now you need to check that you know this object which you chose. It kind of has a topological invariance that you kind of, if you have a two pitchforks and moving one through another, you get the same things, and it's all checkable, but it's kind of a. It's okay, a but I would worry about it. Up in the no, no, it does exist. You know, it does? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, all right, so that was, I don't know, so then I think it was. You know, I can keep talking. I have also like, you know, more slides on the end of like a Jima stuff, but I think everybody probably. Yeah, but also, um, how about this? We'll, we'll, we'll meet tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Because now uh, we're done with the Jima. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe tomorrow we'll meet and we'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Any questions? So, you know, what I was planning to say a little bit more is about this, you know, Nakajima stuff. If, you, if there is any interest, so, you know, that's. Okay, uh, I'll stop. I think. Uh, um,
I have more to say. No, I don't think I would have more than an hour to say. Maybe I, we can, if, we can keep talking tomorrow. So you know, I can give more details on what I said. And uh, I meant, you know, meant to say something about this Nakajima operators. But if you're interested, that's kind of. Well, you know, you could, you know, I told you that somehow what's uh, the value of this construction is that you can uh, compute this uh, shift on Hilbert scheme for particular side types of braids. Well, you would ask how, how you would compute this thing. Yeah. So, well, how you compute it? Because uh, you can compute it using this uh, known uh, technology. You know, this uh, Hilbert scheme of points was studied for so long. People developed this technology, in particular, people developed this technology of this elliptic hole algebra, which is basically tells you how to um, add points to the Hilbert schemes. You know, if you kind of, you can go for Hill band to Hill band plus one, and they're kind of, the, on the level of, of uh, cohomology, it was defined by Nakajima, it's called this Nakajima operators. Mm -hmm. Then there are categorical versions of that. And you could see it in this story. So, and then, then if you have the categorical version of it, uh, then you can just apply this Nakajima operator uh, machinery to compute some this, you know, the shifts for the, for example, you know, like, you know, you, you could ask, you have a braid, and I just add another strand. So then it turns out that going from this braid to this is exactly in the Kojima operator. So here it was like a you know, shift on heel C2, you know, heel two, and this is heel C3, and to go from this to this, you just apply in the Kojima operator. Then you can do some, you can do more, much more stuff. You can, What is computable? Yeah, yeah, that's. Um, it's computable for the class of the uh, braids, you know, like a, uh, like a torus knot. So for the torus knots and the iterated cable torus knots, you can compute things. So this is probably the process in the VVAC also. Yeah, so that's, that's in our paper with VVAC, the torus knot story. Yeah. Oh, okay. that's right. but, but you said it is for those, it is computable. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there is some kind of, I write some mathematical conjectures about this, but you know, basically this class of nodes is special because um, they could be obtained from a node by this Nakajima type operations, the one, one, one thing. Another thing that is special that uh, normally when you do the triple graded homology, uh, uh, the, there's a kind of a, the T grading is kind of complicated and uh, uh, complicated meaning that it doesn't have any parity pro property. So, you know, for example, T parity, parity. So, you know, you want to have like a T grading to be only in one parity. If that's the case, then you can kind of restore. Uh, you mean there are some differentials that are not there? Yes, some differentials are not there. And that's what would be the case for those. Oh. Yeah. I mean, you know, from uh, floor theory, you know, you know that, uh, that in floor theory, this algebraic objects are simple because if something comes from the algebraic geometry, then all dimensions are like everything is in even dimensions. And you just would not have a differential. Yeah. That's what happens, you know. The, I think in this floor theory, you know, the only examples where people can actually compute something when it comes from algebraic geometry, because the floor of differential is just zero and you just count objects. So and something like similar is happening here too. Okay. Much harder to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we get the same formulas I can we uh, yeah we, we kind of you know because the formulas which you get they come from the you know the you use the um, McDonald polynomials and you can relate McDonald polynomials to the Hilbert schemes and then you get your formulas back that's 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 embedded in this So your grading, you, your grading was, you know, your, your story was some kind of, a, you kind of look at this uh, McDonald polynomials, but you kind of set them, you know, so one of the variables is the root of unity for some reason. I don't see, you know, I don't see this restriction. Oh, that was the point, because it was, that, that was the way of then actually aligning. Uh-huh. It was kind of I think the selenium. I think a selenium variance is more complicated, you know, for example, uh, it's a pretty much open problem to compute 
Havana of homology of torus nodes. And the answer is way more complicated. So you know, that's one thing I can say. It, it does not match, for example, with your answer. That's, that, that, that was checked. That's, Right, right. Right, that's right. Oh, sorry. Right, right. I mean, I'd like to remind myself what is that. Right, for example, for this uh, torus nodes, you could even have like a torsion in this uh, homology. And clearly, it's not easy to see torsion from this uh, McDonald's polynomials. Yeah, um, it's as I say. You know, I just want to repeat. It's like it's an open problem to you know, even to find conjecture for the uh, Havana of homology of torus nodes. So I have like you know tables for like uh, on two strands, you know, two, three, four, up to seven strands. I have answer for the torus nodes, and you, know, some kind of, you can see some terms, but in general, it's some kind of mess. It's like not easy to see. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Well, two also, you know, one develops first. I mean, eventually people will develop first. The way Kavana had first, there is no paper. We are actually, we deliberately stayed away from any kind of first. So, the one thing which you said, you know, maybe it would also answer your question, you know. Like, in this theory with the uh, Hilbert scheme, one thing which is kind of amazingly easy is adding full twists. So if you want to kind of, look, for example, what is like two n torus nodes? You know, let's say two, uh, you just take a one crossing and add a lot of full twists. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. If you want to do by definition of Havana of homology, it's really hard. It's, it's, it's a computation. For us, it's just one line because if adding twist, it's just multiplying by a line bundle, this uh, standard line bundle. And basically, if you compute it one braid, you compute it infinitely many braids because you cannot full twist. And there are even more general story when you kind of add these juicy Murphy elements, they're also kind of free, so you can get them for free. So, you know, that's in some sense, it's, it's a very computable theory because if you compute something for one braid, you compute it for infinitely many braids, just like twist them by some line bundles and get the right answer. So that's, I think that's the one of the big selling points of that. Sorry, I exhausted everybody with that.